and welcome to This Week in Hospitality Marketing, live show number 260. I always enjoy we change over the numbers from a five to a six because it means I have to do twice as much work changing all the little numbers and all the links that we have to provide. So we're in the 60s now. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> with me from what would be my left to right would be Dean Schmidt with, um, it's going to take me a while to get all these right, Dean. Uh, Metasearch. Okay, okay, first there's Basecamp, Metasearch. Okay. Basecamp, Metasearch. And Meta. then there's Metasearch. Mm. Metasearchmarketing.com. Thank you. One's training and one is um, uh, services. So get that. Uh, Mr. Emerson on from Flip2. And uh, then down, down to the lower is Mr. Jason with Hospitality uh, 2020. Right? Hospitality. Yep, yep. Recovery. And, thank you. Recovery. That's forgot the word. See, I'm really great as a host. It works so good for me. <laughs> 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 Mr. Dale Goodman, who is uh, with uh, Aspire Reputation, formerly with Library Collection. And she'll be telling us more about that as, as things begin to come out. And Mr. Tim Peter with Tim Peter and Associates. That one is an easy one for me. I'm good with that one. That one got that when down. It's been a few years. You name your company your name. <laughs> Make it, it works so much better. Oh, oh, and coming oh, from across the country. Really arrogant, but, you know. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Tristan Hayward with three and six. <laughs> Hi, guys. How is everybody? Hey, Tris. Hey, Tris. Welcome. Tris. By the way, Lauren, I still work with Library Hotel Collection. That's true. Yes, my yes. always my favorite client now. Oh, well now. <laughs> <laughs> so we're doing something a little different today. I mean, I, 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 I was just mentioning earlier before we started. I think I've kind of awoken a beast. Where uh, in times past, I used to make the list for the show, as Tim knows way back and Ed knows way back. And then Robert started adding more and more to it. Finally, Robert just took it over and started doing this really great list that he's been doing for years now. And then as time's gone on, because Robert's been so busy, last week we talked about on the show about saying, hey, guys, since we have such an amazing group of co-hosts, why don't we all bring something to show and tell to the table? And uh, boy, be careful what you wish for. Ask him to show me TV. <laughs> yeah, and truly, genuinely that. Now, Robert was really nice. He still sent us our list, so we have all those fun things, which will always be in the show notes for us. And for those who want to subscribe to it, you can always subscribe to his. It's for free. He does it every week. It's really an excellent list, and you can uh, subscribe to it at bit.ly, B-I-T dot L-Y forward slash rock cheetah, all lowercase. With that in mind, Mr. Jason pumps out some awesome content as well on Hotel Recovery every 2020. Every single day. Every yeah. single day. Every single day. 24-7, rain or shine, snow or not. <laughs> the editor of the internet, I guess, is what you can call me. That's that's yeah. what I'm going to go for. That's my new title now. Which, which goes a little <laughs> bit to what I had thrown in as a bit of a uh, – uh, something that got stuck from last week's show was uh, I really got cynical of, well, about how this white noise, general basic conversation never seems to get out of first gear with people. We're still talking – not us as our show, but our industry is still seemed to be stuck in first gear of – generic white vanilla repeating each other like magpies basic stuff like you should be doing ppc you should be oh my gosh if you're thinking at that level right now you are cooked <laughs> <laughs> and and so i really wanted to kind of ask and which is where we got some great articles today in conversations as to vamping up the conversation being at that level that needs to be done at this point not Gee, if you haven't got this figured out by now, you're going to be behind. We, we know the people talking basically are, are behind. So that's kind of the theme to all of this. I know that we're going to have people popping in later as time goes on. I think I got a, a ping from Valen that uh, she'll be coming in later. I don't know if Stephanie's going to be joining us later or not. Uh, I, grabbed, I actually grabbed her article as my little show and tell to throw into our conversation today. But with all being said and done, where would we want to start? Which article out of all the ones that we threw into a pile do you think would be the most interesting to ping first? <laughs> you know, can I just mention that based on what you just said, that, you know, we're rehashing the same thing over and over again. I just found it um, interesting and funny that uh, when I was reading uh, about the Hospitality Sales and Marketing International having a round table, uh, you know, as to, you know, what they're, what, what's happening with uh, human resources and how they're deploying their, their teams differently. And people are saying, wow, we're really learning how to use our tools, you know, to their full extent. And we're really, you know, having to be creative and do more with less. And it was just stunning to me that we have to wait for a crisis to think about 
um, how to be creative and how to solve problems differently and how to utilize our tools to the best of our ability. And, you know, taking the time to think about, do we really need to be spending money on this? If I save money here, can I perhaps spend it better somewhere else? And I just thought that I think everybody really needs to think how to not have, need a crisis. Well, I mean, here's the, the challenge with that is, as we've all seen throughout our careers, the travel industry has gone through some pretty long streaks of anyone can do well. Um, and it's really just the, the, what feels like endless growth in, uh, tourism. Um, and, and when you look at it, the only thing that really has disrupted that are major events, uh, at least dating back to the late nineties. So that if you look at that, um, and you understand that, then you kind of can get why our industry continually falls into complacency. Uh, some of it is just um, the riches that just accidentally fall into people's hands. Uh, the gravity of tourism to the, the major cities, uh, the opposite effect that has to less major tourism destinations. Oh, this city is just too crowded. I'm going to look elsewhere. Uh, the, the massive growth in our industry has led to this complacency. And you can't overly fault people for it because oh. name a major mistake during any of the good times that, you know, really financially hurt someone. And you really can't think of too many because being present to win has been the primary driver of success for at least the entire time I've worked in the industry, which is now turning into a pretty substantial amount of time. Well, it's, a, it's actually a nature thing, right? I mean, I, you know, I learned my best lesson post 9-11. Right. I worked, uh, I started in digital during the dot-com boom. And I got to tell you, during the dot-com boom, nobody in the world was better at digital than me. I mean, because it's just amazing. Everything I did worked. Clearly, <laughs> I was the best <laughs> digital guy in the whole damn world. Right? And then 9-11 happened. And I was like, oh, wait, this is hard. <laughs> oh, it wasn't so me. I very oh, much oh. I very much was one of those folks where you know sometimes it takes a crisis before you recognize oh I'm you know I'm actually just sitting in a boat that's going up with the tide and if I'm going to outrun the other boats maybe I need to do something very different so I mean sometimes that's a that's a normal thing that's going to happen in people's experience that until you get kicked in the teeth a time or two you may not realize not all of your success was because of all of the things you were doing. You know, I'd like to think I was doing a good job. Sure. Yeah, but isn't that a sign of leadership to have somebody with a vision that we can do better? I was just looking at a, I was looking at an article, it came out last year, not this week in hospitality, but last year an article came out saying, oh, you know, uh, Marriott is still doing fantastic in guest satisfaction, and it was 80% for Hilton and Marriott, and they were at the top of the game, and with Hyatt and Intercontinental below that, and Wyndham about 70. Now, when I went to school, if I got 80, that would maybe be a C. <laughs> Right. And I, 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 you would think you have so much money on the line and so much potential revenue on the line that don't you think you deserve better than 80%? Don't you think you could inspire your team? To but I think some of the right, but the cost, the cost of doing that outweighs the benefit at that scale. And it's, the and cost... It's not Yes, yeah, sorry, it's not, I was going to say, and it's not always. I think to, to Adele's point about the leadership there is, I think we, what we've got to do is we've got to look back at what what we're the, the times we're living in, um, and these times are to to use an overused word are unprecedented. Not because of COVID, not because of any of that. Look at it in a much bigger view. We're going through the internet age. We're right at the very beginning of this. And the, the pace of which things are changing is so rapid. You look at all of the people who are leaders now, 
where they started out, the internet probably didn't exist. Because I can remember the time when it didn't exist. And I'm sure pretty much everybody else on this this call can remember when it didn't exist. exist. I'm saying we're all very. <laughs> Before the internet. I mean, yeah, to be time. fair, while I was alive during the time that there was an internet, I was too young to say that I very much remember time before the internet. Sorry, sorry, sorry Ed, you just look as old as no, me. Kids, kids, kids. <laughs> the sad thing about that is I was making the joke and Ed is serious. That, yeah, I know. I know. Yeah. Ed wants to get in there that he's the youngest. That's the thing. <laughs> or, or maybe Stuart's just being quiet as well, I think. Yeah, no. Well, I was thinking that Ed's only a couple of years younger than me, so I don't, I don't know. Well, think about it, Stuart. It's been a little bit. In the life that you were interacting with the world mm -hmm. in a meaningful way, can you remember? Yeah. I, I mean, mean, when I went to, to college, the internet wasn't in, anywhere close to what it looked like now. I mean, it right. was, sure. it was in its infancy, but, but right? what Tris said is the time before the internet. I mean, <laughs> yeah. so that's, that's pre-AOL. That's you oh, know. fine. Rub it in, all you youngsters. Right? <laughs> but, but I think it's more more than the internet, right? I think society and, and maybe the internet's part of part of the equation. But society has changed, right? We're, we're all woke now, or a lot of us. Are, and its expectations are different. The, right. the power has shifted from the corporation to the consumer. That there, there's a lot of nuanced things that have gone on to making the world the way it is today. And I think all of those just add to the challenges that hotels. Space and I think to, to Ed's point, scale is one of the reasons that Hilton and Marriott cannot achieve the level of success that someone like well, Adele has achieved in her history, right? And, and, and in a smaller scale. And that's an important point of when we try to talk about our industry. Uh, is it's a an industry of different realities. You have these mega scaled companies who care about completely different things than the small business aspect of travel, right? Um, Marriott is not chasing the same dragon that a, you know, five hotel operator in a city or even across five cities is chasing. Well, well they have a different customer, customer right? right? Or a customer right. is not a company owner who might be a customer of Marriott or might be a customer yeah. of right. or things along those lines. Right. Right. I mean, they're more interested in the satisfaction of the person that, that purchases or leases a franchise from them right. than they are about the customer that walks into the door of that hotel. Right. They yeah. don't care. There's, as long as they get their return. There's a great as model. long as they get there's as long as they model. get their monthly fees. <laughs> well, but there's a great model, and this is this is a model I use all the time with customers, depending on who I'm talking to. Uh, but this is this is a really useful model about thinking about who your customer is and thinking about Visa versus thinking about American Express, right? American Express's customer is the cardholder and they do everything that they can to make the customer experience and the, uh, the experience for the cardholder better. Uh, Visa's customer is the bank, right? And they will do things that are good for the cardholder so long as it benefits the bank. Now, they always want to make both sides happy, the, the, the bank and the cardholder. But the reality is, when push comes to shove, if there's conflict, Visa is going to lean towards the bank and, and American Express is going to lean towards the cardholder. If you're a boutique hotel, you're American Express. If you're Marriott, you are Visa. Yep. And yeah. it doesn't mean that you don't want to do what's right by both sides of that equation. It's that your purpose for being and who your customer is, is a different person. And that engenders a very different response because they're actually doing what's right for their customer. Yep. And it's, and it's, the it, customer it, the guest and this case. isn't the only right. industry that exists in because oh, the other thing that exacerbates it for these large scaled companies is they're public companies. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> you know, bottom line yeah. is, you know, wall street ruins companies. It just does. <laughs> very few companies, statement. <laughs> very few companies go public and stay good and the ones that do become very famous you can look at them it's google it's amazon it's facebook and why did these companies turn good they didn't forget who they actually serve Which, and what their way, actual strenuously push back on facebook is good yes yeah, yeah. 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 i, I, I got to tell you listen they stayed true to what their belief is even after going public 
And so it's just those beliefs. I still think continuing a vision is not in, inherently good. I mean, just look at the congressional right. hearing this past week. You, oh, yeah. I mean, there's well, some major if, problems. If the congressional hearing has taught this. us anything, is we should stop letting Congress be the ones asking the questions of tech <laughs> billionaires because it's not a good look for the capabilities of our government. Yeah. Uh, but I, do think, I do think we need to come back to Adele's point because I think right. Adele's point is. You know, if you are a hotelier, and we've had this discussion on the show a lot of times, but I think Adele is exactly right, and I think this is something we want to think about really carefully. If you are a hotelier, if you are a hotel marketer, be clear on which business you're in. Are you, you know, in the business of serving a franchisee? Are you in the business of being a franchisee? Are you in the business of hospitality and serving a guest? And if you're in the business of serving a guest and you're getting 80% on your, your SAT score, you need to be doing a lot, lot, lot better. There's a slide I use constantly in a presentation. It's, it's a Jeff Bezos quote. And it's something that, you know, I would I would paste to my wall if it went with the decor that I want to have. If it was on a guitar, I would absolutely put it there. But Jeff Bezos famously said, you know, uh, your margin is my opportunity. The reality is there is somebody coming for you all yeah. the time. Mm-hmm. And you got to be thinking about that. And it doesn't mean that you have to sacrifice your margin because if you actually deliver great hospitality, people will pay more for that. If you actually give people a great experience, people will pay more for that. If you give them a truly differentiated experience, people will pay more for that. So it's just thinking about what business am I in? Who is my customer? And am I holding myself to the same standard that, you know, that my customers should be expecting? And, and also don't fall into the trap. I mean, 80% is pretty impressive when you think about the majority of the portfolio of those companies. We always fall into this trap when we think Hilton and Marriott in our heads, we think of their flagship properties. In reality, the majority of their offering is select service. Well, well but I would argue, I mean, I've said this many times, I'm a Hilton fan, generally speaking. Mm-hmm. And I would argue right now today, and there's a lot of reasons for this, you know, new prototypes, things along those lines. But at scale, Hampton Inn is the best brand in the industry. Right? 100% agree. Far, Hampton Inn is, and, I don't think it's, and I don't think it's close, you know, nope. at scale. Right? I agree. Now, give them five years, give them seven years, maybe the product will get more tired and yada, 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 and somebody else will step into that. But you can even see it in Hampton Inn's progression in ADR. I mean, if you remember, it wasn't that long ago, you wouldn't see a Hampton Inn above 90 bucks a night. Now, good luck finding one below 130. Right. Um, to, to lend a little bit of what Adele's saying and, and to a little bit of point that you made earlier, Ed, uh, we're creatures of habit in some ways. And, and firsthand experience for me for some clients is, and as Tim pointed out, there's those that are running it as investments and those that are running it as hoteliers. Those that run, tend to run it as investments or whatever. They have to first go through the process of what they used to do all the time, which is, oh, throw money at it or uh, silver bullet the answer or uh, uh, take that off the shelf and plug that back in. And, oh, surprise, it didn't work, (laughs) you know, and they have to go through that. Oh, crap. You know, now what? It's like we actually have to take care of the guests. Say what? (laughs) That that comes back to the point that I'm saying. The people who are uh, genuinely in, in leadership don't actually know all of the answers. But if you don't foster an environment where people below you can actually give you the answer that you're looking for or deal with specialists, then it's always going to be the, the most senior person in the room has got the loudest voice. Yeah. And you're, you're always going to uh, uh, bow, bow to that. Voice. Whether it's right the hippo, we always call yeah. it. And yeah. as you know, I am I not a paid person's opinion. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'm not an apologist <laughs> at all for the big brands. But again, the biggest thing we're leaving. Anything at all. (laughs) Right. (laughs) I will say the bottom line is a lot of what we focus on that they could do better, quite honestly, the investment it would take versus the return it would create for them is not mathematically, it doesn't make sense. And part of the reason for that is, is you have to remember, first of all, if you look at the majority of the owners of these branded, you know, uh, offerings, it's their investment banks. You know, you want to talk about one of the most difficult companies that I can't imagine being a hospitality centric person, but you know, there are certain massive REITs in this world. Uh, one of them at one point owned a substantial amount of one of the brands we keep mentioning. They don't care. Yeah. 
<laughs> they don't care about hospitality. This is real estate to them. And you can poo-poo on it all you want. They're the largest real estate owning REIT out there and have proven time and again that they make a crap ton of money by timing and by, you know, and, and yes, do they ruin the hospitality of the companies that they have? Yeah, absolutely. They're nowhere near as good at hospitality, but that's not their game. They're playing a real estate game and time and time again, they continue to become as wealthy as some countries uh, GDP. Sorry, just let me. That may be true, but you could increase your rev bar by probably 35, 40%, something like that, just by increasing the guest satisfaction by communication. Communication yep. only, not changing the carpet not changing the light bulb, not physically changing anything. Most of the complaints are communication problems, either the way I'm speaking to you or the way I'm listening. Mm -hmm. And, and, and that is why, you know, again, there is opportunity in this industry. That is why Stuart tomorrow, if he wanted to, could, you know, have a fair shake at owning and dominating uh, you know, owning a hotel and dominating a market with it because of that effect, that fact that the, uh, you know, the big brands that are kind of the consumer's initial entry point to this industry, um, you know, they thrive, but they also create opportunity, just like Amazon creates opportunity. Amazon actually did something interesting. They put the herd on Walmart, which actually gave a resurgence to boutique businesses. Walmart was killing boutique small business. Every town they went to, the boutique small businesses went out of business. Amazon started putting a herd on Walmart by playing a better version of the game that Walmart was playing. And what was the weird effect of that? It actually allowed room for service and communications and all of that to be enough again to make a thriving boutique business. Uh, and that is the interesting duality of our industry is you could go into any market, like Adele has said, and you could do things to, to completely kill entire swaths of the inventory of that market that are actually not overly hard. Adele has proven it time and time again uh, with what she did with library. You were in incredibly competitive markets with massive amounts of inventory and you weren't big. And yet you destroyed them all when it came to guest satisfaction and what that could do for that boutique business. That mm -hmm. is the really cool opportunity. It works with Lauren. Lauren can go into any market and outmaneuver the inventory of that market in attracting guests. Why? Because he knows the massive gaping holes left that you can go after and drive success. That's the cool thing about the industry. I see commonalities between Adele and Lauren and all the other successful people that, that we've mentioned and in, in how they're passionate about their, what they do and they give 110% to it. And they understand their value and what they bring to the table. And the, the, I think that separates people. And a lot of people got complacent to everybody's point on the call. And, you know, to go back to what we initially started this, this conversation about was, you know, Lauren saying, you know, how do we, you know, how do we step up what we're writing about and what we're reading and the content that's out there? Why is it all the same message? And, you know, Adele mentioned HSMAI. I love HSMAI. Everybody's everybody's reading and consuming more content than ever before. They're they're at home, you know, refreshing all day, um, and uh, uh, marketers know that, and they're trying to get in front of them, and they're trying to shove out as much content as they can. And sometimes it it's you know it's getting out there. It's it's it's, it's trying to get your name out there rather than bringing the value and rather rather than, you know, providing something that's useful for hoteliers or for guests. If you're a hotelier, you know, understand the value that you bring and, 
you know, offer some best practices to help others yeah. rather than just trying to get your name and your message out there, I think. Mm-hmm. Agreed. Yeah, we've seen a shift, right, in, in, in the purpose of content. And the noise-to-signal ratio, I'd argue, is worse now than it's ever been in our industry because because vendors, uh, they, they look at content as a mar- as an advertising hook, right? It, it's just part of their sales process now. And it's this whole content marketing strategy phenomenon that started probably about 10 years ago and has really grown tremendously is, is the cornerstone. And I mean, looking at fuel, it, it is too, but we we try to discern, we try to be discerning about the quality of the content. And I don't think everyone does that. They just, it's, yeah. it's volume for the sake of volume. And I think that's, that's problematic and why people like Lauren are getting frustrated. But the thing is, I think both of those problems we're talking about with, with the, the, the flags having settled for a certain level of, or standard of, of reviews and the, the vendors in the market putting out crap content, it, it's about doing things well takes a certain skill set that is really hard to scale. Right? Because yeah. we just pointed out that Adele did a great job with Library, that Lauren does a great job. These are exceptional people. I would argue they're both within the top 1% in the industry easily, exactly. probably the top 1% of 1%, right? You can't scale to people like that. You can't right. be Marriott and say, I'm going to go buy, hire a thousand Adele's to do what she did for all my portfolio. It, it just You can't do it. The, the talent is not the caliber of people to do that, to focus, that dedicated focus is, is not realistic. So you. when you talk about economies of scale, there's a flip side to that, right? And it's the cost of scale, which is you can't do things really, really well. And that's why the, the article that was floated around, the Hotel News Now article, um, about how the, the flags are going to dominate independence was total garbage. <laughs> it was <laughs> looking at it completely from the wrong lens. Right. And everything they said was, was just, I mean, well, it, and it, heralding it very myopic, heralding the brand's technology stack. I yeah. mean, yeah, I could piece awesome. together a technology stack that would run circles around that by using right. like 10 different options at each touch point. The difference is, yeah. is you know, it, it's it's lazy, it's lazy reporting. Yes. It's uh, it's singing an easy message because it is obvious. It's obvious that actually this was a huge opportunity for the brands. I've talked about this before. Could have easily been. Right? Could have been. Completely the, completely yeah, whiffed. yeah. It could have been like a pivotal moment in the big brands on actually taking back. Uh, you know, the primary position of ownership with the consumer, but it's not going to be because well, w- of, you know, because of the fact that they are all, they've all decided to take a path of survival versus right. taking the risk path of trying to dominate. And it's like, it's like um, when a hotel says, I need to save money right now. So I'm going to reduce the thread count on my sheet. Right. right, that yeah. has a consequence. It saves you money on your P and L this week, but it costs you down the road because now your guests aren't having as good a night's sleep, and that costs you. Right, the, the brands are doing this exactly right now. They're saying we're going to pull back on our staffing that liaise with the individual properties. We're going to limit what the properties can do at the exact worst time to do that. The properties need autonomy right now more than ever to say, "Here's what's going on in my specific situation." Here are our protocols. Here's our local areas. And, and they've been cut off at the kneecaps. The yeah. individual no. properties have no control because the infinite wisdom of the flag said, hey, we need to save money, so let's just shut all this crap down. And it's it's the worst time to do that. There's Unless been one you need the brand evidence. flag for the loan, why do you want to share your money? You know, because they <laughs> don't take a percentage of the incremental value they add they take a percentage of everything yep. well, it's simple though know. i mean here's the thing if you want to own a hotel and you can't do it with your own money you're kind of forced into a brand because yeah. the banks are not going to give you a loan without a flag i mean and this is the de facto survival and you know kind of the base benefit that the brands have is there's a good amount of owners that if they didn't have that brand's flag 
they wouldn't have the banknote that they currently have. Well, and and I know Dean's been trying to jump in, so I'm going to say one quick thing, and then I'm going to immediately throw to Dean. (laughs) But, you know, I also think we have to think about chain scale in this, you know, because at different chain scales, the brands can provide an enormous amount of value. I'm an ex-Wyndham guy, so I'm going to show my stripes here. You know, Wyndham has its places where it works really well. But, I mean, you think the economy segment... You're talking a 70 room property, a 75 room property that's charging 75 bucks a night and running at 50% occupancy. That's a million dollar annual revenue business. The people who are buying into those businesses don't yet know how to be hoteliers. And I'm not saying that as a knock. Those are brands with training wheels, right? Yep. That is entry into the market for a lot of folks. And so you know, the expectations have to be a little different. The guest expectations have to be a little different. You still need to do it well. And Adele is exactly right. That's precisely where you have to do a good job with communication and service because you're not going to differentiate an economy product on, you know, thread count, right? Like that's just not how you can make a living doing that. So it's also understanding what are the, what are the brands bringing to the ownerships and the ownership groups at different uh, chain scales. And I think once you get above, you know, economy, things along those lines, that the question becomes a much bigger one of whether or not it makes sense to be brand or independent. But Dean, you've been trying to say something for like an hour. So. <laughs> Dean's got to jump in his elbows. He's got to jump in. <laughs> one to, early, to uh, Ed's earlier point is that part of the reason that the, these brands love these, are the franchisees love these brands is, as he was saying, that technology stack. Yes, could we build a better one? We're all technology experts on this call here. We've all seen better technology out there. Is it easy? Uh, no, right? That's, so I'm, I'm a hotel. You're bringing me a package. You're putting it on my plate, saying, here you go. We'll do all this for you. Of course, I love that. But the other thing I wanted to bring up, too, was the one exception to we talked about everybody was scaling back their marketing and such. There's one exception out there, and you've probably seen there's one brand that is running TV ads left, right, and sideways. And I'd love to see their stats as a result of this being Choice Hotels. And they've been really marketing the road trip that and that type to that type of demographic. So here they are, the only player out there advertising on television. Take a look at some of the digital marketing space that they're in. They're owning their MetaSearch. So they came out of the bin. But by the way, again, I can speak for MetaSearch. It's really cheap right now. I'm assuming the TV ads are less expensive than usual. I don't know that. But I think it's a fairly safe assumption. Uh, And they're the only ones in this space dominating. I would love to see the stats resulting from that as to how much gain they've seen as a result. Yeah. Well, really, nor one. <laughs> from a brand standpoint versus unbranded is this cold start versus warm start from a reservations funnel standpoint, right? So if you go into a brand, if you open up a hotel or you reflag, you're you've got a pretty good funnel right from the beginning of reservations. If you come in unbranded, you've got to build that market and you have to build it from the ground up well and if if you're going to operate an independent hotel you really have to know how to hotel whereas if you're going to own a fairfield inn you just know how to you just need to know how to run a business uh and and we know there's a big difference there now dean i will counter one thing well i agree that choice has been spending really interestingly i think hilton got incredibly lucky timing wise that a Netflix series that basically is a Hilton commercial <laughs> dropped at a time that they needed this the most. Uh, so have you guys seen Zac Efron's series um, Down to Earth? It's blowing up on Netflix. It is literally a Hilton, TripAdvisor, and Visa commercial. Um, and, and it's insane uh, what kind of exposure it's been giving to those businesses. And it's the best kind of exposure. It's subliminal. Look and at you, look at you uh, there. Uh, you're down with there. the kids. I'm you're not down a with the kids with all of the Who's that? Who? What? Hey, just real quick, I want to hear Melissa out of the chat room. She's been kind of leaning into a lot what Adele has been referring to when it comes to reviews and limitations of some softwares that are out there, obviously. Uh, but, but incorporating that process into uh, the value proposition of the hotel, I think, is kind of a quick recap of some of her points that she's made off to the well, side on that. And one point to jump on that, and I, I mean, this is what Adele is getting to a lot. You know, even if you're in a chain, even if you carry a flag, right, in many cases, your brand is only as good as your last trip advisor would be. Right. Period. So it doesn't matter what the brand's 
reputation is if you get two little bubbles on trip uh, trip advisor you get you know two little stars on trip like travelocity this would be expedia or booking travelocity remember when there was travelocity uh, i know when you're right now you know yeah. you're but you're doomed it doesn't right. matter what the flag brings to you or not at that point. And yeah. I worked for one of the largest franchisors in the world. We saw it all the time. People understood. I like, you know, insert brand name here, right? I like Wingate Inns. I like Super 8. And there are people who love Super 8. I don't like this one. And I don't right. like that one over there. But most of them are great. So it, yeah. you really have to do a good job regardless of whether or not you have the flag. Because your reviews are going to kill you. And well, gonna, and, and I actually awesome. think Wyndham and Best Western and, you know, players like that are those types of franchise systems are actually poised to potentially have some strong growth. Um, they provide some of that financial uh, stability for financing that these owners need. However, they don't uh, restrict the minutia of what a hotel can do to control not nearly as much. I mean, uh, a full serve. And, and again, I'm talking, best Western, I agree completely. Well, best Western. Absolutely. But I think Wyndham's got some good flavors. I, I would there. agree based on our experience with Wyndham and the other big brands. I would completely agree with that. And I think, sorry, to, to bring it back to... A, a well, I, work there, well, I was a jerk, I don't know. <laughs> gotten a lot better, Tim. A lot oh, better. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't be a bit surprised, actually. So bringing it back to Adele's point there about the, the, you know, the whole 80% thing, and, and, and to, to one of Stuart's comments that seems a little while ago now, but you're saying that you know Lauren and Adele are in the top 1% of 1% of the, of the game, and you can't scale it up, and we're talking about opportunities with brands. Surely, though, there is a way to scale higher than 80%. I mean, we're not, Adele and Lauren are going to bring this to 100. They're, they're, you know, they're, you're going to bring your A game. You can't go any higher than that by, by taking on practically anybody in, 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 this, in this chat right now. If you were to take somebody on to do a piece of work in which they're specialized in, you're going to get 98, 99, 100. That's what you're going to get. You're going to get the top. If you're settling lower down at 100, at, at, at lower than 100, you're settling at 80, there is so much room for, uh, for opportunity there. And to Adele's point, this isn't stuff that you have to put a lot of money into. In fact, you have to put no money into it. It is a mindset. It's leadership from the top. It doesn't even have to be leadership from the top. People who own um, a, um, a hotel, who are perhaps not involved in it, have a management company, don't actually do a great deal when it comes to the hospitality stuff. It's your middle management. It's your, your decision makers, the boots on the ground. Finding good talent that doesn't have to be at 100%, but finding good talent at 90%, that's doable, especially in this market. Yep. I'd be looking right now, and, I, and we have been looking right now. There are some brilliant people who have just suddenly found them uh, on the wrong side of COVID, who've just found out that you know all of that hard work that they put in, all of those visions and ideas that they had for a brand or for a technology company, just gone like that in the space of three, four months. And now they're wondering right. what to do next. There is so, so many. Just, so let me respond to that oh, as soon as you responded to my response. So <laughs> I, I don't think anyone's saying that they shouldn't strive for better. I don't think anyone's saying that at all. No, no, no. no, no. Yeah. And, and I think at the property level, you're 100% right. Every individual Marriott or Hilton or whatever should should be out there striving for 100%. And, and, and they're, they're capable of doing that if they care to, right? The problem is a lot of them don't care to. Right. Because they're reeks and, and they're, they're looking at the, the spreadsheets, not the guests, and that's what drives their decisions. And there's almost no incentive at the corporate level, at the franchise level, to put the level of investment they would need to into it to move the needle in a meaningful way. There's, there's right. almost no incentive for that. And, and so it was this is where, yeah. Sorry, sorry, Lily, which is what I don't get because. Ed, you already mentioned it before. You know the companies that have got a vision and an ideal that, that then go on to dominate the market. Netflix is a classic one. Their, their entire ethos and policy, their deck is available on the internet. Whether you agree with it all or not or whatever, irrelevant, they have a company identity and an ethos. And by doing that, they've dominated the market. They killed off Blockbuster. 
you know, way back when. Remember that? The way we were really showing our age now. But they've killed off that to become the, the, the monster of the app. Google, again, you know, they've got a very set identity. Their identity is that the person who uses their search engine is their customer, not the people who advertise on it, not the companies that advertise on it. So we see, so we see from an upselling standpoint, which is, you know, a way to drive incremental revenue, brands or no brands, where we see hotels being really successful are hotels with imagination at the property level. Yep, mm -hmm. so, because if the, it goes sort of back to somebody's point about being a business owner or a hotelier, you know? mm -hmm. And okay. so where we see, where we actually see properties able to generate that incremental revenue, even now, are properties with hoteliers in charge. Yeah. Yeah. Whereas the business people are like, no, we're not going to do that. We're just going to, you know, we're going to do what the brand tells us because we don't really know how to run a hotel business. So we're going to just do what the brand says. And then they're at the mercy of the brand, right? Because the brand's forward thinking, right? If it's not, it's not. But it, even in the non-forward thinking brands, we see real success in this. It just takes guts at the property level and some vision and courage to execute. And I got to be honest with you, let's be happy. All of us in this room should be happy that none of these giant scaled brands care to chase that last remaining opportunity. Because yeah. if they do, Adele, if Marriott tomorrow adopted your policy, your everyone's job will get infinitely more difficult. Because if Marriott across their chain is at 99% happiness with their consumer, that may, it turns into a arms race on how, okay, what do we have to do now? Cause they, they're big enough to raise enough of the consumer expectation that like it's a, it's an, it would become an endless chase on how ridiculously happy can we make the consumer? Uh, and it would God, put, be a it, tragedy, Ed. Hey, <laughs> you, you, you say it that way, but that actually would substantially crush the independent hotelier because it yeah. is how they're different. Yeah, you're they're right. different because they can be specialized and better in ways that the brand isn't. If the brand tomorrow became as good as Lauren, Tim, Stewart, Adele, Tristan, Valen, Lily, me, Dean, we'd all be out of business. Because <laughs> you know, oh, you're never allowed to work for Marriott. So, yeah. <laughs> so we're, now we're feeding on the, the space that they left. And it's just like I said with Amazon. Amazon left a space yeah. for boutique business to thrive again. Well, Walmart wasn't doing that. Walmart was crushing small business. And it's actually why government, local government started pushing back against allowing Walmarts to develop inside their city. Amazon said, well, Walmart's crushing, you know, uh, strategy leaves opportunity for us to actually kill what they were really going after, which is there are certain things that people just want to be able to buy cheap, easily, quickly. Uh, and so Amazon went in and stole that. And what's happened now? They stopped chasing the crushing all the business in an area. And now it, it gave rise again to boutique business. If Marriott and Hilton tomorrow decided that we're all their CEOs, we'd actually crush the small business aspect of hospitality by scaling out our ninja-like you know, <laughs> look at this world. Uh, it's, it's an interesting problem. I want to include so you, a little bit of what so Melissa and Richard are saying up on the side here. Richard, for for people who may not know, Richard Farrar is with us today. Richard has been with Marriott, was with Marriott, very high up uh, for many, many years. I, I can't even remember all the pedigree titles that he had, but uh, Richard has been with him for for uh, generations of, of, of progress, and uh, he will eventually be on the show with us at some point because he has some amazing insights. But besides from that, with also Melissa and the reviews and so forth, we do have real life examples of what we're talking about. When we first started going through this mask issue for hotels, dividing what Tim pointed out of those that own versus those that run as a hospitality person. I thought, I thought uh, we I weren't allowed to mention the I love the because now. they immediately said, we're enforcing this on our guests as well. We blue states can. Hmm? What's that? Those of us who live in blue states can talk about masks. Yes, right. Yeah, no, no, no. <laughs> for the hotels that did, immediately Airbnb, added the fact that they're requiring their guests to run with masks, I was like, that's great. You're running on the right side of the conversation. But then there was ownerships that are like, We'll do what our brand is telling us to do, 
but we don't really, we're not going to go over and, and, and tell our guests to do the same thing. And it wasn't because they just weren't centric on the, on the safety experience of, of everybody at that point. They made a business decision. They weren't going to jeopardize telling somebody they didn't want them to stay with them because they were having to enforce a guideline that they didn't want to go over and jeopardize revenue for. Until all of a sudden, brands start saying, oh, hey, no, we're going to jump on the wagon that everybody else is jumping on, which is we're going to be, you know, asking all of our guests to wear masks as well, so forth, just like the retailers and so forth and so on. Then all of a sudden they said, okay, we're going to do the same thing because we have somebody to hide behind. Oh, the brand's making us do it. Leadership and hospitality-centric business is we do the right thing for the right purpose for all the guests, and then we make that decision, and it's, and it's you as a leader, you as the GM of that hotel, telling a guest, I'm sorry, but unless you follow our guidelines, I can't have you stay at our hotel. Not I can blame somebody or it's a municipal rule or my brand tells me I got to do it or hide behind somebody. It's the leadership of saying, hey, we've made this decision that at our hotel, we want our guests to follow the same guidelines that we make all of our staff follow, which is your protection, our protection, mask, washing hands, cleaning stuff. So that's the kind of difference we're talking about when it comes to review scores and how they impact. Now, Richard pointed out the fact that he didn't see a correlation about that, though. You know I, what? I, I think that in a, in a company like like Marriott, though, you're spending a lot of money on advertising. You're spending a lot of money on loyalty, and we don't have to do that because well, yeah. our guests bring our other guests to us. Right. You know, it's deeper. And it's easier, and it's a hell of a lot more fun. I've been in a restaurant of a certain chain hotel right across the street from my, uh, my office, and the waitress was crying after an hour not being able to come out of the salad before the show, before the Broadway show. And, and she said, there's, all, there's, all, there's one person in the kitchen. We tell them every single day that this is our time. When it's before the show and we're going to have hundreds of people here and there's no way in the heck we can ever get the food out and and she's like literally crying to us that nobody will listen to her. you know yes, that communication has to be able to go up the ladder Make i just kind of interject quickly before you move on from the brand versus independent topic that uh sam trotter who wrote that piece is one of us he's a he's a he's a good guy yes. I'm trying to help out the industry. I'm sure friends with many of us on the show. That was, and I may be the only one who knows the difference, but that was an opinion piece, which is <laughs> different than a reporter going out writing a, a multi-source piece. I, I give him. I don't know what's the difference. Topic and and, 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 and encouraging the discussion. Um, I think that uh, you know. I wrote back to him. We had a little conversation about it. I think. He's right. I think it, when you're talking about critical mass, uh, more travelers will trust that, uh, like Tim said, Hilton uh, Hampton Inn has got it right. They've partnered with Clorox or whoever it may be, and you see that message everywhere, and you trust that they've got it right. Um, I do think an independent can do a better job. Uh, it's just harder, to Dean's point. It just requires you know, you know, to figure it out as an independent. You have to figure out how you're going to present it. You have to think right. through, you know, uh, all the aspects of it. Whereas a Hilton hotel, you just have to do the thing they told you to do. And Hilton's taking care of the rest. That is, that does make it easier, but it doesn't mean that that's yeah. going to own the heart of the consumer. This, this leans a little bit towards Tim's yeah. article that he shared. And I didn't put the texting up, Tim, because you said it was behind a subscription wall. And I didn't want to share mm -hmm. something that they pay for. But the article, and you can speak to it directly about it. I agreed with you completely, Jason. I thought. Going through this COVID thing, this was the chance for brands to shine. Like, okay, we got this. You're going to look for a systematic clean, cleaning programs and everything else. This, I'm sorry, Airbnb is kicking our butt. And they're doing it with less money and they're doing it with better messaging. And it was the thing I thought wasn't going to happen. I, thought it was I mean, because you know what? Airbnb can say whatever they want to say, and they don't have a gigantic investor. I agree with owner. you. There's a lot of you know, they don't have, they don't have KSL 
calling the CEO of Airbnb going, what the heck are you promising? Have you lost your mind? Do you know who put you here? And, and so, you know, Airbnb has a little bit easier of a time because they don't have any concentration. There's no voice for the, right. the unit owner. There's no top of the funnel for them. It's right. a big entity that's all multi-headed. Yes. Right. Marriott could easily do that if they didn't care about better. their hotel owners. They could say, and hey, they, we're and they didn't do care this. about Wall Street. Right. <laughs> however, however, it really does come back to marketing and messaging because one of the things that and it, you don't have to promise anything in this case, but one of the things that Airbnb has always done really well is that you feel like even though Airbnb is a corporation, because of the use of hosts, you feel like you're dealing with a person who you can form a relationship with, who you can reach out to directly. And they are able to accomplish this even on a, a big scale, whereas with the hotel industry, we still have a tendency to treat our hotels like you're walking through Walmart looking at products on a shelf and you take one off. There's nobody, you know, you might be able to stop somebody and ask a question somewhere, but we treat most hotels like a commodity and we've got to get back. Well, you can, think, you can thank the OTAs for that. That's the trap. Right? Everyone mm -hmm. fell into the OTAs. Exactly. We're trying so hard. Everybody's right. websites look the same. Everybody's offerings say that their hotel room comes with an ironing board and a hair dryer. Like, who cares? Tell me what makes you different and what makes you special. You know, at the end of that article, uh, Sam, my friend Sam, said, uh, you know, if the brand can uh, nail this guest experience thing as they're trying with the with the with the small with the smaller brands um and they have all this stack and technology and everything they can win the day but i say the reverse since they're clearly not interested in really nailing the guest experience then the, the boutique hoteliers have an opportunity or maybe the technology people can put together a stack for us that is affordable and reasonable where we can, you know, be sharing an app somehow that makes it easy to book all kinds of different boutique hotels that are not related without paying OTA uh, pricing. You know what I mean? Like a room key for independence. <laughs> Which is Expedia. <laughs> can, I, can I go back to something Jason said too about, you know, it's an opinion piece. And I think anyone discerning would, would pick up on that. But it yeah. wasn't presented that way at all, right? It's on Hotel News Now, right? A news, considered a news outlet. It didn't define that this was his opinion. It, it was stated as a fact. And I think that's problematic. I, because it didn't, it didn't give a, a an it is both sides opinion, of an argument for what it's worth. And as we got there, it does say the opinions presented here. I write a quarterly column for Hotel News Now. It is listed as an opinion every time. I mean, yeah, but I don't know whether or not people how many read people read the footer, people right? it, Most I mean, people, we're lucky if people read beyond the headline. To be fair, I, I, I mean, I, I think. Oh, well, sure, it, sure. Well, what's the, the, what's the, the chat of it is, things that are tweeted where nobody ever read the article? <laughs> it's like <laughs> seventy percent. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, but my my point is, people will read the headline, and I think it's a little misleading headline. I think it, 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 it there's some truth in what he's saying, and I don't know the guy. I, I mean, I don't have an opinion on on his knowledge or his background or anything like that. It's just I've, I've read an article and I formulated my own opinion about it, and, and Lauren gives me a form, form to express that. But it, it read to me like if if you're a flag, you you have a pretty safe opportunity to be okay in the long run. Um, and if you're an independent, you don't. And, and it really was more if you're a bad independent, if you don't run your operation well, then you're going to struggle compared to the brand. But but I think but you could look at every one of those points. For if you're a bad experience. brand hotel. For sure, right? A, a bad run hotel is going to be worse off than a good run. A well well, run hotel. I mean, I'm, have to this. I'm having a side conversation with Richard in the in the comments. And just, just to point out, I mean, you know, there's a funny part about this that we're not giving the brands enough credit from the other side. We're not giving the franchisees and the hotels enough credit on the other side. You know, 
Uh, when I left Wyndham, we had about 7,500 hotels. We had about 5,000 owners. We were 100% franchised, right? So we were a big brand in a different way. Wyndham never got the same like kudos because the room count was so small. But in terms of actual properties, we had more properties than anybody at the time that I left. The challenge that we ran into, interestingly enough, where reviews played an enormous role, um, was if the brand as a whole was getting terrible reviews, the good owners left. So it was an enormous franchisee retention problem because we would have owners who would say, I don't want to own X flag because 80% of the owners are dragging this flag through the toilet and we can see it every single day. So there is a baseline level that the brands have to maintain a minimum because their customer, who is the franchisee, not the guest, are going to say, you know what, I don't want to carry that flag. And that's a huge problem from a different perspective. So it does and knowing it knowing you know, from time to time, but it's not knowing it's not analysts. I would guess that that bare bottom is like seventy eight percent, and they're all hovering at eighty. <laughs> uh, no, <I laughs> minimum mean, investment, as you, as you might imagine, as you might imagine, when you talk scale, and I mean Dean can speak to this a little more recently than I can, uh, but you know, I can tell you. Like anything, you had 10% who were extraordinary. You had 10% who were extraordinary at the other end of the scale. <laughs> and 80% fell somewhere between those two. You know, it's yep. something of a bell curve. Um, well, and to their credit, the 10%, you know, 10 of the... I, we launched something on, the, on digital when, uh, uh, when uh, I worked there. It was one of my great horror stories. We launched something on the websites across all the brands. And we pissed off 10% of the franchisee base, right? Now you say 10% of the franchisee base, you got it right for 90%, right? Except we had 750 angry franchisees. 750 angry franchisees on that specific day by itself was probably the third or fourth largest hotel brand in the world, right? It was yep. a lot of people who were pissed off. So it's one of those things of, there's a lot of folks there, and you have to do a good job for them as well. Uh, Richard just said, the good guys do push and push. That top 10% really do try to make yeah. the brands better constantly, yeah. and and sometimes they succeed at it. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Oh, there's exceptions to all of these things. That it, bio, I hope nobody understands that we're saying that there's this generalities that exist. And there's no exception to these. There are stellar brand products. There is stellar location, oh. stellar operations that a high volume of it. On their own. Right? Like when you look at the whole numbers of the properties that are stellar that happen to also have a flag, it's a big number. It's a big number just because yeah. of their scale, right? Right, right. Um, you know, it's just when you look at it in aggregate, it doesn't look so good. <laughs> I mean, and it's like Tim said, because for every one of those stellar brand properties, there's a bookend on the other side. That's, How little can we get by with? Well, minimum we have to do it. <laughs> right, and and so this is this is the challenge and opportunity of commerce in general. When an industry is scaled, there is every single type of business operator in there. Just like, hey, listen, we are some of the better, uh, you know, kind of other side of the industry vendor, if you will, uh, you know, out there. I I think every single company here is a great company. We know there's some really crappy vendors. <laughs> in our space that are the bookends to this uh to this group uh, even true, let's man. talk about what jason does i can name two or three bigger players than jason that you know give uh news in our industry a really bad name because it's news um you know so you know there is obviously a, a a big gray area here, and for faster conversation, we're focusing on you know kind of extremes. Uh, but the bottom line is, is anyone who says any article that says someone is going to do better because of a very simple reason, uh, they're they're oversimplifying. It's going to make that article super easy to pick apart, just like all of us did. Uh, in regards to this, it doesn't mean he didn't have good intention. Is he wrong on the things about a brand that do give them benefit? Absolutely not. I mean, he is 100% correct that those things about brands do set them up to have success. Now, is he ignoring 
all the things that are hurting the brands right now? Absolutely. So, you know, like understanding that he's not wrong. He's just not, you know, he's, he's coming to a, uh, an extreme, uh, result off of a couple of things that do give them benefit that doesn't really support the extreme result. And that's fine because it, he's throwing an opinion piece out there, um, which also left room for us to talk about this for yeah, as sure. long as we have. We can disagree. With to, to so he's, end, he's uh, won. To, to that end, Ballard, <laughs> when we first inspired the, hey, what do we bring for show and tell today? Ballon brought together an article from The Atlantic that I wanted to throw in because Dean said he had a little throw against it as well. Yeah. And I don't, I don't want to miss that one. And I don't want to miss what Stuart threw out there because I really do want to talk about what it's going to be like to be online. Tim, and sir. unfortunately, I do have to, I do have to bolt. I can only be here for the first hour today. Uh, we were just going to get to the and, and between you and Val and between the backdrops, we need a jam session somewhere to come out of this. <laughs> <laughs> it's a nice Ivan is, by the way. Until next time. I think we're recording the end. Your associates, where do they find you? Where do they look for and all that kind of and your super cool podcast? Uh timpeter.com is where you can find everything. Timpeter.com slash podcast if you'd like to listen to the podcast. And I am TC Peter on Twitter for some reason instead of Tim Peter, which is where I am. And Tim, just so you know, I'm gonna be connecting you with a gentleman named Ian. He has a dream uh panel that he is uh moderating. Uh people from Amazon, Google, and I forget what other third one, but just huge heavy hitters out of uh, Microsoft. And it's for Cornell University, yep. and he asked me who the best moderator in the world I know, and that's you. So um, you're the guy that told me he's got to talk to you. <laughs> well, now I'm, now I'm <laughs> hey, Tim, if you have um, any openings next week for a quick catch-up, can you shoot me a couple of options? Yeah. Thanks, Again, Sadly, I have some openings. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> work hard, everybody. Have a good weekend. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I'll see you all soon. Bye, Tim. Okay, so Tim Val, had, had enough openings last week to, to slum it so far down the poll that he was on our, our podcast last week. So, wow. He, 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 really was he, he raised the bar tremendously. That guy I, is a certified genius. I thought because he showed up on the show this week that he really was pretty much out of a gig. He was homeless. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, Maybe um, that's why he's doing that podcast. All I know. can say is normally when I come in 30 minutes late, I have to really do some wrangling to get everybody on topic. But you guys were all talking about, like, smart things when I arrived. <laughs> so I just yeah, don't sorry. have anything to do this kind of, week. I kind of stepped in and kind of put the bumpers. I mean, no matter what kind of venture off, she's just like, no, no, back here. So speaking, <laughs> so speaking of venturing off. Because I'm one of those people who does that to us. Uh, you, you know, your mentioning of Cornell uh, reminded me of a fun fact I wanted to bring up for weeks now, which is Cornell is no longer the number one ranked hospitality school in the United States. Oh. I did not know that. You're going to say... UCF Rosen School of Hospitality Management yeah. just got ranked the number one hospitality school in North America, number two in the world. After what? What was number one in the world? Uh somewhere in France, I think. Ooh. It didn't matter to me. I saw UCF. I was like, oh, look. Um, <laughs> actually, there's two things about that. College football fan doesn't care about anything but his college. Uh, and American doesn't care about anything that's not in America. I mean, I, I'm hitting both stereotypes right here. Um, but yeah, what's amazing about that is how young that school is. That school is only, uh, what, 16 years old. And it's it's risen to number one in North America. Uh, that's pretty cool. Right. They need better um, public relations, man. That should be everywhere. What it is. is. I mean, I haven't read that. I didn't know that had no. happened. No. Well, they don't so care about any of us. None of us are going to go. <laughs> you think they'd blanket the industry with that? You would think. <laughs> it all depends who's ranking them, right? Yes, that was Ed. It, he didn't say, but it was Ed. <laughs> Ed. Independent yeah. Ed study. Yes, an independent yeah. Ed study. Independent, it's a study from Edward St. Andrews University. Um, so, Valen, the cleaning article, the uh, Scourge Hygiene Theater and so forth, and I threw that up into the chat for anybody that may not have seen that through in our email screen earlier. It was fascinating. Can, I, can, I, can, I, can I just say, before you talk about this article, that it was one of the strangest things that's ever happened to me. Like, I'm pretty stubborn, in my opinions, a lot of times. It takes a lot to persuade me. And I started the first couple of paragraphs of this article like staunchly in disagreement with the guy. Like I was, I was, I, I was thinking about all the ways I was going to pick it apart, and he gradually, gradually pulled me over to the other side to where I was completely agreeing with him at the end of it. It was crazy, really well written. 
It, is a, it was a well written article and, and also made some very good points. Really I mean, good points. Yeah. 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 yeah um, on, on the surface, I disagree, but then by the time he dug into it, I'm like, huh, yeah. Is that I a can, pun? Can... On the surface, you disagree? Are you, are you being yeah, no, I wasn't. I'm not that clever. <laughs> because as we discussed before, the perception of, of cleanliness and health and wellness is really there. And for a lot of people, they're not going to read the article. I hope we all share that article, but. <laughs> Probably not everybody is going to read that. And and remember also that there was a time that they said that masks weren't so important. Mm -hmm. And they changed, you know. They People have gone back and forth about other things. What if, you know, five years from now they say, oh, we were wrong. You know, the clean is more important. The, the thing is, is the mask thing was for a different reason. It wasn't because they didn't know. It was because they needed us not to be buying masks because they needed them. Um, you know, you had companies that were sitting on stockpiles of N95 masks for other reasons, but they had massive stockpiles of them. Uh, and we're happy that they had massive stockpiles when this whole thing kind of hit because they went, oh, great. We, we have what we need to take care of our people. And the, the government did not want a run on masks, uh, so they lied to us. And actually, what's interesting is they, they solved a short-term issue and created a massive long-term issue by coming out straight up saying, you don't need masks. Backing off of that is impossible because you were, you're either admitting you were lying and manipulating back then, which then are you lying or manipulating now, right? It's, it's this whole problem that they created and to solve right. yeah. they use the word mask they use the word yeah mask. I, in the beginning I think you're mask. Sorry. most of the face is covered yeah right so yeah L lying was always the wrong decision yes. as it always <laughs> is and they should have just shown us like the uh surgeon general did here is how you take a bandana and make yourself a mask easy peasy and I already told you about the, the underwear <laughs> And we, we may be giving the government a little too much credit, too, because the science has changed. The understanding of the virus has evolved. How it's transmitted is better understood today than it was back in March. And, and there was a lot more concern back then that it was transmitted by a contact. And, and I think for the most part, most science suggests now that's very unlikely that it's right. transmitted that way. Yeah. And it is. By air, right? So it, I think you're somewhat right. I think that we were manipulated or misled, but I think the government did it with good intention and with the knowledge they had at the time. But it, it has changed. And right. Well, I used to be margarine because no. I thought it was good for me. Hello. Well, I think the other thing with, this, with, with this article is that it's the it's the idea of getting it from surface content, right? So in the early days. People were told to wash down their groceries, right? You remember that? You're supposed right. to bring stuff home and wipe down your groceries. And then, but but then they figured out that really a virus, if it's not living in a host environment, which is in your head somewhere or in your lungs, it's dying. Right. It can only, it has a half-life. And so it's dying when it's not where it should be. So, you know, we don't, nobody. Hardly well, and it's probability, know. right? Right. You know, it's, even, it's, even a desktop it's, it's that has a thousand droplets or microbes of the virus, the chances of you touching it and then getting it into your body are, you know, it, it's, these are pretty, so, I mean, it may still spread that way. The problem is it's, it's, are you likely to get it that way is really the question, right? So sure, they, they, it could be transferable through surfaces, but you would need a surface dense enough and a likelihood of touching the surface and then within a reasonable amount of time, touching a part of your body that would allow the virus to enter your body. You know, statistically, that's just, it's not and, likely. And there to be enough of the virus entering your body. Right, for your immune system to not be able to immediately knock it out. So, um, so yeah. what do hotels do, right? So, you know, the, in the early days, there was leaving rooms empty for 24 hours, right? So somebody would check out, you wouldn't check somebody in then, you would wait a day. Or you and you would have to, as a hotel, you would invest in you know, very, very thorough cleaning and pay the price for that. And is it do we do they have to do that? And that's the I think that's the big challenge for hotels. 
Yeah. Right. Well, well, remember, if you office, remember when we had the professional cleaning company come on, one of the things they did talk about is you can look to restaurants for the answer. So restaurants right. deal with, um, you know, how do you keep surfaces at an acceptable amount of cleanliness to not cause problems? And, and they have methodologies of testing. How, you know, what are the correct ways to spot test whether or not something needs to be sanitized versus just cleaned? Because really, this is the difference we're talking about here is standard cleaning or sanitized. Um, and, and you know, the answer is, like everything, not at the extremes. It's not you don't have to leave your room empty for a period of time. And it's not you you have to, you know, bring in ultraviolet light and noxious chemicals to kill every living microbe. The, the answer is somewhere in between where you just need to have a good testing procedure to sanity check, like, is there viral load on the surfaces in this space? And if there appears to be, then you run a sanitization uh, right. but we're, cycle. But we're looking at it from one yeah. perspective, right, which is the, the risk mitigation standpoint. But there's two, there's two battles we're facing. There's two answers to the question. Like, should we close a room for 24 hours for the next guest? Well, one is, is it going to make the guest any safer? The other is, it, is it going to make the guest feel safer? Right. There's right. a psychological component to it. And, and we're in the job sure. of marketing and reassuring the guest. So we need to make sure that we're convincing the guests that it's okay to stay. stay. Not that it is okay to stay, but... They, right, they but again, it. it's not so much what you do, it's how you communicate with it. So Correct. you, know what? Yeah. you but, could communicate yeah. that we are following sanitation protocols of kitchens. That sounds so, cool. Yeah. The perception right. becomes the reality, right? So Jason, <laughs> Jason. Dean, go get it. Go, Dean. Go, go, Dean. Go. Go, Dean. Go, Dean. Go, Dean. I came across something earlier this week that, uh. that was really interesting, and, I'm, and I don't want to name the company or the product because I'm not trying to do this as a sales pitch, but every once in a while, you see something that makes you go, holy crap, that's it, right? And so I saw this, this program, this guy build, it uses near-field communication chips that you can basically plant all over the room. Uh, so you can have 10 of these in the room, one of them under the bathroom counter, one behind the bed, one behind the nightstand, one under the chair, whatever. And then it mixes with a software program where the housekeeping has to have all of those touch points and it tracks them throughout the room. Oh, I know what you're about, yeah. Okay, yeah. so this does two things. One, it's a visualization to the consumer. I can show the consumer Here's exactly what was done to your room before you got there. And I can show how much time they spent in the bathroom, how much time they spent on your bed, and so on. Okay, now. Which is the uh, biggest uh, flaw uh, in stopping on. them from being able to sell to hotel owners is that. Right. Well, <laughs> hang on, hang on. So, and I was getting to that exact point, actually. So, obviously, you don't want to have somebody come to the room and see that the person just cleaned the bathroom and didn't do anything else, right? So the other side of this, what happens on the front side, though, is it's also an operational tool. So that housekeeper actually has to have all those touch points, and they have to go through all those things, or the system actually dings them and triggers them, buzzes them, whatever, notifies them, hey, you skipped a step, you have to go back and do this, and they can't close out that room and move to the next one until they finish that process. So it's actually an operational tool, but then also give a consumer-facing side to it. And I saw that, okay. oh, crap, that is really cool. And they haven't anyone else thinking to... about the ways to game it? Like you well, just walk around the room real quick and not tackle well, that, the box. That's you. part of the problem. But what's stopping them, what's hurting them, is they are really obsessed with the consumer-facing side of it. I had someone affiliated with this business kind of ping me about, hey, they're having a hard time here. It's very smart people behind this. Yeah. The operational tool side of it is actually really interesting, uh, but problematic with unions and things like that. I was wondering um, about that. But the consumer facing side of it, well, it's a great idea. And yes, certain consumers would look at this like, wow, this is cool that I can know that like my clean guarantee. I don't have to take their word for it. I can see. Um, the problem is, is no hotel owner in their right mind wants to go down to that level of detail right. unnecessarily. Um, because then you're beholden to literally every single employee every single day doing exactly what they're supposed to do with no room for oops you know they're having a bad day and they they went through 12 rooms and forgot two touch points 
Uh, and now all of our guests think like 12 of our rooms are huh. gross. So, but you corrected immediately. Yeah. What, what, what is, is that, um, and I'd like to compare this to the difference between what the U.S. and the Soviets did about writing in space, where the U.S. Just, you know, spent tens of thousands of dollars to make a pen that could write upside down, and the Soviets just brought a pencil. Right. Um, you know, the idea is hotels are getting smart about being able to create their own uh, solutions, like opening the window to the room after somebody checks out and doing a little negative airflow and just let that blow out. And for hotels that don't have openable windows, they're literally by the floors, opening the doors to the hallways and putting those big, you know, carpet drying fans and just shooting the air out just to say we're cleaning the air out so that when you come back into the room, it's not the same air somebody just was there in for whatever. But also to it, and this goes to the core of this, I have a better example of perception versus reality, and that's eggs. Because eggs have come and gone back and forth in good or bad for us for decades. And it turns out to be an individual choice of, do I listen to the hype or not listen to the hype? Do I just like eggs? You know, whether they're good for me or not, I still like eggs, whether I have them scrambled for it or whatever. The idea is at the end of all this, the perception, I think, which is the point to the article, is the reality of our world right now. We know that the security of going to an airplane is about 80% bogus, and I'm just making that number up. We know that people, if they're really hell-bent on blowing a plane up, they're going to find a way to get past that. It's a sad truth, but I think it's a real reality that people, you know, they're going to find a, a different thing, whether it's in the sneakers or whatever, you know, as they tried before. The idea of it is that we have a perception of that safety, the same too without coming through this. Seeing people clean touch surfaces, to your point, Ed, cleanliness versus sanitation, just the act of effort will be probably a qualming effect to people about, hey, this hotel cares, compared to the you know, pick my nose, sign the paper, hand it to you. Uh, maybe not so much, you know. So we have to incorporate this into our future tense. No matter what the reality of its value is, we have to continue this process of the guest perception. So, I, I mean, if I if I was one of the edgy small hotels, like, or small hotel brands, I'd be putting out funny messaging, like, our rooms are cleaner than your house. Our <laughs> common spaces are cleaner than the gym you go to. <laughs> our our kitchens are cleaner than the grocery store you shop at because we know it's true hotels are just like they're just no you literally just say it like that why do you need yeah. to prove it that's not how perception works yeah. by saying it and having the gall to say it gets the majority of the people receiving the message to go yeah they have no reason to say it if it's not true i mean that's just how consumer perception works Right. This is where the, the, the article flipped me, right? And, and I started the article think at the same mindset, which is the perception matters. That was, That's really what matters. It's can we get people yep. into this place and they be safe, right? But the primary thing is can we get people into there? And so my, my opinion going into it was this whole cleaning theater, elaborate, um, you know, whatever is – is a good thing for the industry. It, it helps build confidence. It helps reassure guests. It helps get things back on track. But I think towards the end, the point they made, which I think is a very valid, valid one, is it potentially, this is Tim's when you invent the ship, you invent the shipwreck analogy. It's, there's an unintentional consequence of That's right. creating a false sense of security, which mm. is if a guest comes there thinking that they're going to be safe, they may not wear a mask. They may not socially distance. They may not wash their hands which are things that they still need to do. So I think there's a balancing act, and this is where I flipped, is, okay, I was all in on the, the theater, but I don't think it's you do that in lieu of other stuff. I think you've right. still got to hammer home that reckless behavior cannot be accepted, and that that's really going to be the key. And i gotta, and I got to be honest with you, too. Like, it, especially when you think about a large amount of our industry is leisure travel right yeah. now. Like, that's really all the travel that's happening. Leisure is generally families. Anyone yeah. who's had children has a much lower sense of sanitation than anyone who hasn't had children. Because when you've had a sick child who you know is yeah. sick, stick their hand in your mouth because kids just do that. Yeah. You start to lose sensitivity to paying attention to how sanitized something or how sanitary something is. Once you've been puked yeah. on and peed on, it's all over the yep. yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there's a, there's a different level of what bothers you. Um, and, and our industry is primarily serving that desensitized audience. So what's um, about this, and this goes to Stuart's point, is that 
it, I mean, and the premise of the article and the focus of the article was on clean, on cleaning. But you know, if I'm a traveler, knowing that this thing is more easily transmitted via air than it is in contact versus surface contact, I'm actually more interested in knowing that people in the hotel employees get tested on a regular basis. That you actually have a a process where if, a, if an employee does test positive, then they do this and this happens. There's contact tracing within the hotel, and everybody wears masks, and the masks are clean. I'm a little, personally, I'm more interested in that yep. than I am in the cleaning. Now, again, the focus of the article was on cleaning, but I'd be super interested in understanding how to address that because you can talk about cleaning all the live long day, but it's not the primary way the disease is transmitted. Yeah. And now that we Where's know it? that, Jason, you're, you're muted, Jason. That's why we're not. Yeah, but I think it's. Go ahead. Go ahead. Apologies. I think it's more about the experience than it is about what what kind of cleaning are you doing. It's what what's my experience at your hotel going to be when I get there? Do I have to go to the front desk? Am I going to be handing my card to somebody and they're handing it back? How does housekeeping work? How does um, you know if I want room service? Are they going to come into my room? I think it's spelling all those things out. You know, how long am I going to be there? What's my experience going to look like exactly? Um, I think that that is more helpful. I think it's also really hard for us to sit here and say we're experts on what you should do in a time like this when nobody has any idea what's mm -hmm. what's. Coming have you not seen this show before? We pretend to be experts. Oh, <laughs> I am not a doctor, but I play one on my iPhone. I did it on the Holiday Inn Express once, so. I think that's It's just really hard to know how long this thing is going to last and how you know, what standard operating procedures we should be putting in. Listen, if it's only going to be a month longer, three months longer, and we've got a vaccine and COVID's going away, then don't leave your, you know, maybe we maybe we can't afford to leave our rooms on open for 24 hours just to make people feel safe. But if it's going to be 2020, end of 2021, 2022, before this goes away, that is unsustainable. Right. Mm -hmm. Like a lot of the current operations and ownership and the extra expense we're putting in the cleaning is, is really unsustainable. So it's it's kind of hard to make those decisions without knowing what's right. next. Right. In the right, which is, I think, what the article was talking about, right? That was the point they made, that there's danger coming from setting this false sense of security by doing things that really don't make a difference. So using the example of having a room open for 24 hours is not long-term sustainable for the industry if we want to get back to profitability. But if we set an expectation now that it's necessary to do that to keep you safe, right. then at some point in the future, we've got to change that narrative and say, well, it's just like the mask thing all over again. Well, that doesn't really make a difference. Right. Or for those those who have become the standard in the in industry, it carries on that standard for a very long time. As Lauren yeah. mentioned about the TSA as an example, some guy 15 years ago put a bomb in his shoe, and ever since then, we've all had to take our shoes off to go through the security, right? Definitely. And nothing's happened ever since then. 15 years, I should probably not on whether they say that, but here's the reality. That became the standard, and now that's what we do. Uh, back about that same time, gasoline prices were 4 and $5 a gallon. All of the airlines added on a fuel surcharge tax every time you bought a ticket. Yes, Never look, took it off. $4 a gallon anymore, but that surcharge is still on there. I mean, so once yeah. it becomes the standard, it's hard to reel that back in. I, I think also, too, this article does, I hope, point out uh, something interesting, too, and that is this one upsmanship that we're all, that, that a lot of companies are trying to do. Look what we're doing. We're doing this and that compared to what they're doing, and this and that compared to what they're doing. That isn't a necessary thing. Uh, I think you made it best, Val, when you said, what is it that's going to make me feel safe, period? What What are you enforcing that is being done that we're aware of that is – I have to contribute to, you're contributing to, we're doing this mutually together. I'm wearing a mask, you're wearing a mask, you're getting your team trained, uh, tested and so forth, whatever. All that kind of process is what is more important than just saying I now have a UV zapping machine like a hospital that will sanitize the room. And then I got, well, I got a bomb that blows up in the thing and sanitizes the surface area. We burn our hotel oh, down every day. <laughs> <laughs> every time you walk in, it blows up. <laughs> But, you know, it's that kind of thing. It's like that isn't sellable or sustainable. You're right. We're, you know, we're talking about from current circumstances, current look at perspective. This is how we as an industry are reacting on all the different flavors. But the reality is, is just like the medical profession has learned, you don't slap an incubator on somebody or a respirator on somebody right away. You flip them on their stomach and you do all these other things that they learned 
from the process of the pain of people suffering going through this COVID infections and so forth. Because that there's, what they said, there's, there's no experts on this. This is um, right. you know, we're it's all learning on the fly. Exactly. Right. Well, here's the, the, the versus opinion. We're all opinion. Yes. Right. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yes. But but here's here's actually and and what we're getting to is actually what's caused so much of the strife among the masses is they're not used to having conflicting Right. things kind of fed to them as this is now the way this is now the way things don't generally go in flux like this and it's causing a lot of people to to really have a hard time and stick with this is the one i decided when i accepted that this is the way it is and now you're saying it's not then nothing's real when in reality everything is this way everything changes right. then it doesn't happen in such a compressed timeline going back to lauren's egg example right the eggs are good for you or they're not good for you, but those are sort of over five or 10 year cycles. Right. Not months, weeks. Yeah. But they were, um, they were always delicious though. So I was hoping, really we're always good. <laughs> I was hoping Lauren was going to go nerdier on the egg example and talk about how certain countries we refrigerate eggs and others don't. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah, Which is and right. That's and that's another new reality for the U S too, is the fact that we are now the people can't travel. How's that feel for us? 37 countries in town. <laughs> Feels great if you own a hotel in the U.S. because you're getting domestic travel yeah, that it's, otherwise it's really wasn't good going to. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's going, a, it's going both ways, Delta. right? Yeah. Like, yeah. Europeans well, are, are mourning the loss of international travel the same way that we are because they're saying, yeah. you know, too many people can't come to visit us, and so what are we going to do? We're saying too many people can't come to us, so what are we going to do? In reality, it just means that we have to sell people on domestic travel. Mm-hmm. But and really, it's in our favor, though, is, because... 17 million people fly more fly out of the country right. than fly into the country every year. So right. that's true. a good thing for the U.S. economy. Yep. Very yeah. true. But when we that's come into happening. all of these, like the cleaning and the one-upping and things like that, again, we're treating it all as transactional. Let us tell you about the room, not about how you're going to feel when you're here, what your experience yeah. is going to be like. We need to get back to the core root of hospitality where – I mean, when I was like 15 and had my first job at something essentially was KFC, it was a regional chain. And I went into that job thinking, okay, as a cashier who's dealing with the public, what can I do to take everybody's day and make it a little bit better through their experience with me? And it's not about what fried chicken they order. Like it has nothing to do with that. But how can I look at this person I walking love... in, walking up to me, about to have this experience and somehow change their life for the better, even if it's by half a percent? And that is fifteen year old Lily. Like yeah, what fifteen yeah. you know year old what fifteen year old thinks that way? Right? <laughs> <laughs> of course, Lily, just so you know, if I ever walked into the store you're at, if you were between me and fried chicken, you're already my best friend. <laughs> <laughs> Unless I'm keeping hey everybody, I just to drop off everybody. We'll see you hey, next week. Hey, hey, you before you go, um, uh, your new email address, companies, all that cool stuff. How do people find you? Uh, you can find me Dean at basecampmeta.com or Dean at metasearchmarketing.com. And I'll get better with the names. I'm sorry. I'm just, it takes me about five years and I'm good after that. So we'll get there. <laughs> <laughs> Bye, Mr. Dean. Hey, I want what, what I mean for, the, for somebody to revive that old, uh, I think it's Geico commercial where they had the fans on super high at home to keep the, uh, uh, from people getting uh, sick where they, do you remember the commercial where they had the, the breeze was so hot that the no. mosquitoes couldn't land all that other stuff. I'm just thinking that somebody should revive that commercial. Like, want to stay healthy? And, you know, in the hotel, the whole lobby is super fan, so everything's blowing past everybody. Okay, I'm just... They would probably be destroyed. <laughs> <laughs> Spreading well, I, false information. But, but here's the other thing, too, is... Uh, so, Stuart, you happen to run a uh, company that, you know, has a lot of data on the websites of a hotel. Have you at all looked at, like, how much traffic is seeking out this information that we say is important to communicate in stuff yeah i mean it it's certainly not the majority of people but it's really important to a section of people you know and it, would you it, say it's, it's probably 26 27 percent it's definitely not the majority uh, it's probably a little higher than that but it, it's definitely not over 50 percent of people um so the majority of people are, are going about their business and in, in their their needs are very very rudimentary if you, if you give them a couple of reassurance nudges 
they're, they're good. good to go. They're not, they're not as discerning. And, and think about it. This is going to change over time because you, I've said this before on the show. The people traveling right now, by definition, are the biggest risk takers. Right? Mm-hmm. There's, there's a spectrum of people, the early adopters and, the, and all the way to the, to the late people. It's the early adopters that are the ones that are willing to take the risk. So by nature, they're not as bothered by things just because of the fact they're booking right now. So I think you'll see that that shifting and depending on the zeitgeist at the time. And so there's a lot of things. So it's I will, really I will point people, out, though, but you shouldn't push it in front of everyone. You should, definitely doing, should not push it in front of everyone. Doing things right work. I give you a perfect example. An area I've been watching very closely with lots of interest because it, my local economy depends on it is how are theme parks doing at avoiding being the cause of massive spread not a single not a single like thing has blipped on the radar about cases uh outbreaking because of Disney Universal or SeaWorld. Right. Universal yet, everyone open. was rooting for it to happen, right? The media right. was the media wanted it. it so bad and they were saying how yeah. ridiculous Disney was for opening when they were even though Universal had been open for 2 months and hadn't had a single case, had been running has had some pretty peaky days. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's quite interesting, um, that that's a, not being talked about that, you know, we're now a considerable amount of people have gone through those turnstiles and there hasn't been a single meaningful COVID outbreak, not meaningful enough to be reported, um, by any party. And, uh, you know, that's good news because that does mean that you can do it. And you can move masses of people in the right scenario through a space without causing them all to catch this. Valen, your microphones were a little low today, which I think is why you've been hard hard to get jumped in on sometimes. But you were going to say something, I guess, and uh, before we started that particular angle. Uh, I was going to say, I want to before I go, I want to make sure we talk about Stuart. um, Stuart. Yeah. About cyber high tech and other. Yes. Stuart. Talk to us about sci tech. Side All right. Re- before I do that real quick, I do want to say one of the questions on the study that we've added this time, and I was just pulling it up to see if we had enough data yet. It's, it's coming in, but we're asking people about what we've just been talking about, which is what, what level of comfort would these things give you, or would they increase or decrease your likelihood to stay? And we asked things like keeping the room closed for 24 hours between guests, and there was a, a variety of those. So stay tuned. Next week's show, we'll, we'll dig into that, because I think it's going to be interesting following up on this. Um, but high tech. So for those of you who don't know, I mean, I think everyone in the industry knows what high tech is. But to, to us vendors, to technology vendors, um, it, it's really the Super Bowl of events, right? In terms of where you showcase your latest products, you get a lot of exposure. We we generate a good amount of business, but we also foster a lot of relationships. I mean, I'm on this show directly as a result of meeting Ed at a high tech event, right? It's 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 great. It's Whereas like HSMI Digital Strategy Conference is great for, for hoteliers to network, this is the place where vendors really network. So it's, it's a big deal for us. Um, and it gets tremendous attendance because it's in conjunction with Rock, typically, HSMI is Rock. So you get a lot of people, thousands of people through. So this year, it was originally in June. It's been, it was pushed to October. And then about a week or two ago, they announced they're not going to do it in October. They're going virtual. So they're going to do a virtual high-tech this year. And there's two types of event. There's a live event, and then there's a, a on-demand event. And so we're, we're trying to, as a vendor, we're trying to look through this this pack, these package options now, trying to understand what the value proposition is. And you know, obviously, it's cheaper to do something like this for us because we don't have travel and you know any other booth expenses, electricity, all that stuff that adds up. But they're still charging a good lick for us to do what a quote-unquote virtual mm-hmm. uh, booth. I just I don't have a feeling for what the appetite is for this at all. Like I don't know if it's going to be attended. I don't know if many vendors are going to participate. And it's it just I wanted to have a discussion with you guys to get your opinion on on you know I get I guess this they have to do this. They don't have a choice, right? They want to do something. They're going to generate revenue. But is I mean, are you guys going to be involved in it in any way? Um, do you have hope, hopes for it? I don't know. I think if, if it's free for hoteliers, then I think people would take the time to to attend and do the meetings and and you know especially if they're 
not overwhelmed with busyness because of the uh, situation. So I think you'll have a large amount of the furloughed or laid off workers interested in checking it out. Um, But I don't think you're going to see, just think about your conversations with any of your customers right now. They're all super time strapped because they're on super thin teams. They are not taking on a lot of Uh, distraction, right? Because they're also super time strap, super thin team and trying to change their business. I mean, I will say they are actually doing that. I think that's one problem. But I think the other problem is, is why is high tech good? And why is a trade show like that good is it takes one or two things to attract someone but then they end up roaming to check out other right. things right. Um, and they don't have anything else pulling them away because they had to go and they're isolated They're you know, uh, and they can't go back and say, I just spent all this money so I could go talk to Samsung. They actually want to come back and say, I checked out everything. It's good. The stakes are lower for the attendees. So the attendees are going to come. You may get them to check out one or two things beyond the scope of what they were interested in checking out. But I think ultimately a couple of things are going to keep that pretty short. The second they hit two bad ones in a row, they're just going to move on because they're going to say it's a waste of time. That doesn't happen in a trade show. Yeah. 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 I mean, we, so we took a look. So, so I took a look because I got them on their mailing list, of course, and we have not exhibited in several years um, preferring to move our money over to HSMAI just because that's where our buyers are. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But I always attend. Um, I always buy a floor pass because part of my partnerships gig at Nor One is that I need to talk to potential partners and see what else is, see what's out there. And it's also check out any competitors that might be exhibiting. So, so I always walk the floor and I have, have all sorts of serendipitous conversations, you know, on the floor. I'll run into, you know, I'm, I went and found Stuart because I hadn't met him before, like last year or the year before. And, and then I run into people. I'll run into many of you and we'll chat and catch up and maybe have a cup of coffee or a cocktail. And it's great for relationships, but also sussing out how well our business fits into sort of the overall strategic technology and then also revenue management Uh, strategies of the overall industry. I have a hard time thinking that I'm going to be able to recreate that. Um, Mm -hmm. I I just can't see how that will work. I will try it. I'll go ahead. I mean, I think uh, I'm not a member of HFTP, but I think it's 150 bucks. So, you know, whatever. So I'll, I'll do that, but we are not going to exhibit. I'll test it. I'll go see, I'll go see what's there. Um, But I, I don't, I can't, I I just can't, I can't see that it's going to work. What I did want to do, and I haven't done yet, is go look at the partner that HFTP is using, HFTP High Tech is using, to create these virtual stands. Do right? you know who the partner's name is? It's No, I, I don't remember, but it's in the press release. It's I, on think the that's incredible. I think that's incredibly important, and that's what I'm interested in looking at, too. Yeah. I've been going to High Tech for 11, 12 years now. Um, I think you, Stuart, you you have an interesting question. I mean, there's two parts to it, right? It's the educational sessions and it's the suppliers trying to get in front of, you know, hoteliers. I think the educational sessions will be as good as ever, if not better. So if you're going looking for best practices and tips and and tricks and takeaways, I think it's going to be there. I think for, for a supplier, you know, whether the value that is there in sponsoring or partnering comes down to exactly that. It comes down to how the the platform is able to make it make a virtual event as good as an in-person event and i think they're all from what i've been i've been paying a lot of attention to this and they're all getting extremely better uh quickly so it'll be interesting to see how it it comes to play between now and then um i used to plan i used to be on the hotel data conference planning board and lauren was on there with me for a year or two and you know planning a conference is incredibly difficult and um, you know, I, they're coming up with ways now where you can do the virtual booth space. I mean, you can message attendees like while the, you know, while the, the uh, panel is happening. Hey, if you want more information about this, reach out to us. Um, they're coming up with new ways to connect suppliers and, and attendees. 
Um, so it'll be interesting. I guess my, my takeaway is it'll be interesting to see how it all comes together over the next couple months. Yeah, look at those prices. Oh my gosh, <laughs> they have lost see, that, their mind. That's, a, yeah. I, I, so, yeah, so, see, that's where like the pricing is where it really comes down to it. And the same thing I think came out of BLLA with their um, what they were wanting people to pay for sponsorships right. and things because like that. Because here's the thing: for eighteen hundred dollars, <laughs> which is the basic exhibitor package, and let alone the twenty three hundred and twenty eight hundred dollar level, for eighteen hundred dollars in marketing spend, you could put together a high quality marketing piece and pay to get it in the hands of probably a substantially larger audience than this. This is creating um, so many sharks. This, this for me, opportunity for me, opportunity wise is like, Oh, seriously, are you kidding me? I can fishbowl everybody right now because I can that set of everybody, put it together, offer it to somebody and target who was interested. They should have done, they should have done this at like 500 bucks. Yeah. Cause at 500 really bucks, the yeah. amount of vendors that would have been like, yep. Ooh. Right. Yeah, well, I, I, I'm, I'm very much about the drug addict mo uh, marketing model, which is give it away for free, get them hooked, and then charge them for it. No, I, so, but they can't do that because they, <laughs> they, they don't have deep pockets. They don't have that stuff. But I think, if you, their revenue, yeah. I think if you priced it at $500, mm -hmm. you would have gotten a large amount of exhibitors to it. Probably mm -hmm. people who've never exhibited at high tech before, before exactly. which means your total revenue probably would be higher than it's going to definitely be and, at this $1,800. And it would give more reason for people to actually pay attention, right? Right. Well, well, but the, because, yeah, from what you just said, Ed, there's a lot. We, we've said about their economies like this. Through these kind of economies come great opportunities. Mm -hmm. Great companies come out of these times in our in our history. If you gave a a means for those shoestring, right. I, I'm putting my last shekel in. Well, you just call what the ten thousand row, you know, the one on the far right hand side that could barely afford the eight footer. Okay, mm -hmm. those are the people you love talking to because this is it, man. They put their last dime to show up at this place. They got the one brainchild idea, man. And you, if you're happy, that's where I met Happy, and I thought Happy was brilliant. Yeah, they, their yep. first year was there, you know, they were they were literally wow. a. That's, 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 a, that's a, you know, yeah, that's, that's yeah, it's a plexiglass stand there's not all good ideas on that 10,000 row. Let's be honest. <laughs> um, but, but they, yeah. they made a mistake here, which is they priced it to probably what it's worth next year. Right. That's exactly. Mm -hmm. And they shouldn't have done that because that has right. people like Stuart who Stuart, if it was 500 bucks, would you question? And no question. Wouldn't and actually, if question. it was five hundred bucks, would you probably also buy one of the five or six hundred dollar uh, sponsorship packages? Yeah, Just, absolutely. Right. I end up spending as much. Yeah. So at eighteen hundred bucks, you're only going to do the eighteen hundred bucks. Right. At five hundred bucks, you probably would do eighteen hundred bucks. But Ed, is this because they announced the conference and then had to move it? I mean, they probably had a bunch of original sponsors locked up, and they can't go back to them and well, say, "Oh no, no we." Oh, yeah, yeah, so, you they, can. yeah right? you can. so they're changing it. So we were original sponsor. We were going to have a, tw a, a 20 by 30 this year, no, a 20 by 20 this year. It's the biggest booth we've ever had. And then when this started happening, we, we ended up shrinking it down. And if you looked about a month ago at the, the map, it had been decimated. I, I'd say two-thirds of the vendors had pulled out. It, it was just because right. everyone shrunk their marketing budget. Right. And so they had a punt on this, but they've been really flexible with us. They're coming to us and saying, we're trying to do. We're trying to figure it out. They've been in good contact. Communication has been really good. The one kind of caveat, which we haven't got clarity on, and, and I don't know if everyone knows that they do this, but they they have this kind of seniority system mm -hmm. that goes on at, at high tech, where the longer you've been, the more points you earn, and the more points you earn, the, the earlier you get to pick your spot for the next event, yeah. mm -hmm. and that so that they open it up to certain groups of people based on their seniority. Mm -hmm. I don't know how this year is going to affect that. Like if, if they say if you're not in this year, we wipe you to zero. That could that could cause a lot of problems, and it could mm. be an incentive for some people to stay in. I haven't heard they're doing that. We haven't. But, but got here, here's, it's here's, not a good idea. They could have priced this correctly, gotten the it, same amount everyone. of money yeah. from everyone that they're hoping to get. I mean, it's all psychology, yeah. right? Um, yep. Five hundred bucks. Then you start committing your time to prepping for it. And you know what? Let's uh, because we've put so much time into this, let's let's buy one of the sponsorship packages to get more exposure. But also right. figure too that this doesn't translate well for a lot of presentation. A lot of these companies, they bought their pull-up banners and their back screens and their table stretches 
and and their Chotskys, and that's their marketing knowledge. Mm-hmm. Their product their product knowledge is supreme. That's their but that that's their marketing knowledge. Now all of a sudden you go scratch all that. You got to come up with interactive video, interactive in, uh, uh, online stuff. You have to have all that stuff in a new format that you've never had. And th- and yes, you said thin when, team. They might have let go the only one guy that knew how to do their girl hunter to do that. Well, and it, now does, it does. It does sound like the platform they they've chosen i don't know the name of it has a lot of that baked in and they did say they will create a lot of that stuff for you like if you send them photos of your booth and things like that they will create a lot of that for you so they're they're trying their best how good do you think think that's gonna look well i I mean we're not gonna do it there'll be a lot of cookie cutter looking stamps yeah correct it's It's gonna be a lot of it's it's graphical templates that they're basically you're you can you can choose from a b or c stand configuration right so yeah it's like and some really of this stuff out. too, like Samsung, right? You know, the Samsung yeah. booth draws you in, gets you to get tactile with the screens. By the way, they can spend as much money as they do because it doesn't just benefit them in the hospitality world. Every attendee, tech attendee, every attendee gets exposed to Samsung televisions. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So how do you show and get that through the screen of my Asus monitor? Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, so there's problems, but I think they created the problem by not thinking through pricing strategy. Uh, you know, the base price upsell model would have probably uh, had all of us going, yeah, you know, for 500 bucks, I'll do it. And then you're, you're separating. Uh, you know, I wish yeah. there's a company in our industry that really focused on that psychology of separating the transactions. It was, um, oh, Nor One, <laughs> right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah, yeah, we're all we're all about base pricing and upselling. So right. I mean, yeah. Ed, I'm curious, Stuart, Fallon, what what would you ideally see? What what would you want to see? What would be the best way to get the message in front of the attendees? Because I'm so curious about this virtual event and how we're going to make it work. Because I think it's long term. You know, even even after COVID, yeah. I think it's going to be. Um, so, well, I'll tell you the me, first it's thing. About connection, right? Well. But let's before we get into like the important stuff, let's talk about the basics. I want to see a lot of vendors doing it. Why? Because each one of those individual vendors is going to promote to their customer base right. that they're doing this and, and encouraging that customer base. And then the crossover of that, seeing Nor One, seeing Fuel, right. you know, talking about this actually will build more interest in the attendee right. coming. Um, but if you only end up with 20 booths uh actually i'll be honest with you if you only end up with 50 booths in digital high tech right. there's not going to be attendance none of the other stuff you want to do matters if yeah. you don't have 400 vendors 200 vendors 100 vendors some number of scale where they're going to go to their customer base and push this it's it's yeah and and those 50 vendors are going to be the vendors that can afford it right so it's going right. to be the samsung's and and it's not going to be the happies you know in the ten thousand oh, dollar it's going right. to be the oracles and yeah. that's right for, for me as a me as a smaller vendor in the space right that's it's one of my challenges is always awareness and, and we want to get connected with people that are potentially an audience for my product so one of the value points of high tech is getting connected to people that I wouldn't otherwise be exposed to. They, they get to learn about my product. So Ed is 100% right. Without the vendors driving the train and being on board, which we have until August 27th to, to sign up, I think is the date. If we if we don't have a critical mass of vendors, we're not going to have the attendees. And if, without the attendees, it's a waste of my time. I don't care about the format. I don't care about the platform. I just care that qualified people are going to show an interest in my products and then just turn it over to me to, to educate them and close the deal. That's all I want from this. I'm fearful yeah. that it's not going to happen because there's not going to be enough people. You know, I'm curious, Stuart, kind of not necessarily on the mass of people, but on why you're there, right, and helping people obviously go to high tech to find technology solutions, right? That's one of the yep. main drivers of why people attend it. So yep. could they almost use this digital forum to make that more likely because I know attending high tech last year, I couldn't even get to more than I would say 25% of what was on the floor because it was so, so could they with filters, for example, like what what solutions are you looking for? What are you trying to solve? 
business. I would love for them yeah. to do what BITAC has always done, right? And BITAC is, is a different type of event because it's always it's almost like speed dating for, for vendors and, and, and hoteliers. And so beforehand, you say, here are the things I offer. And then the, the attendees mm-hmm. say, here are the things I'm looking for. And you get connected before. And I go into it knowing who I'm going to be meeting. Right. I that would them. be uh, that would be really valuable to me as a vendor. You know, to do the research ahead of time, come to the, those individuals, knowing they're interested, but knowing that I can help solve their problems because I've already done the research. Right. That so, would be phenomenal. So we've always exhibited at ITB Berlin because we have a sizable market share in Europe, and the ITB is. I mean, it's both pu- trade and public, so it's a little different than high tech. And it's yeah. multi it's multi industry travel, and it's huge. You know, twenty five thousand people or something, but. Um, it, they have lots of different components to support their exhibitors, which is one of the reasons we keep going back because they do sort of the speed dating and they do actually group uh, group uh, exhibitors by area. So it's at the it's at um, the Messe in Berlin. So it's like Javits times twelve, right? So it's this massive convention center with thirty halls. And but they what they do is they group all the like they group all the technology vendors for hotel technology in two or three halls. And then they group, I don't know, all the direct marketing associations for for Germany in another hall. So you don't actually, to Lily's point, you don't have to go through the entire place. You can go, you can pick, it tells you exactly where I am and where Ed would be and if Ed ever showed up or Stuart or any of those. So anybody who's like us, we're always like, we're always in the same hall with Rate Gain and Oracle and, you know, Sabre Hospitality and Amadeus and that kind of stuff. So everybody just knows they can come to that hall and spend two hours and talk to everyone they want to without having to, you know, traipse across, you know, 48 football fields worth of stuff. And I, high tech could do better in the way they do that. But this point system that Stuart was talking about keeps them from doing that. Um, because they don't group those those yeah so you end up with fuel talking about marketing stack technology next to safe lock right. selling right. safes and you have happy next to a wi-fi provider and then right. you've got like in-room refrigerators it's all smattered and mix mashed yeah. um you know right. now i will say it makes it harder to do but since it's a single purpose trade show it also does force right. you to at least do one full Right. Up and down every road trip. Right. Um, There's some serendipity that happens yeah. naturally. Hey, you stole that word from me. He did. Sorry. He did. He um, just stole that word from me. I have to run. Sorry, yeah. guys. Hey, Stuart, I got a suggestion for you if you decide yeah. to do it. And that is... Uh, Don't pay the bill. Don't pay the bill. One is, when I, first off, I think that a lot of vendors are going to give a lot of stuff away to entice people to get engaged with them. I think they're going to give away a lot of Jotsky kind of giveaways. I'll, I'll give a fr- free date with Lauren. That's my, that's our There's one aspect give. there which I don't think is going to drive you business, but the other is do a 360. <laughs> do a scheduled 360 where they, they can put their goggles on or whatever it is like this and 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 actually sit in a room with your team and do the presentation. Because <laughs> so many people love, have goggles. Yeah, they don't have goggles. Oh, they have phones. They have phones. I love you, Lauren. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. Thank you so much. Right. Have a great, have a great yeah. weekend. Hey, hey Stuart, come on Field Travel Podcast. Mm. Yeah, we're doing we're recording episode 160 today on the latest changes in Google's making from an SEO perspective. But if you go back and listen to last week, Tim Peter was on it, and it was really full of his pearls of wisdom boiled down into an hour, and it was really, really good. So fieldtravel.com slash podcast is a place to check that out. Thank you, Thanks, Mr. everyone. Bye. 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 So I did want to say while Stuart was still here, but we ran out of time. Um, I attended, so Oracle Hospitality had an innovation week uh, last month, uh, all online. And the point of it was a little different. It wasn't really a trade show, but it was to jumpstart. So Oracle's, you know, trying to kind of keep up with the new PMS providers that are building, you know, uh, open APIs. So where it's much easier to connect with them and Oracle's not. Oracle Hospitality has not historically been known for that. So they did this innovation week where you could sign up. Um, you, you had to be a registered, you had to be a certified partner, or you had to be, you had to sign up for the certified partner path. Um, but they built a Slack channel. So just a Slack workspace mm-hmm. just for this. And then they had a Zoom workspace and they, they, were, they had integrated the, the way those two apps can work together. And they had their staff, so the Slack channel ran 24 hours a day, five days a week, Monday to Friday that week. And they, it was fully manned. 
So that no matter where in the world you were, building an integration with an Oracle product. So it was both Opera and Symphony, their POS. So it's both products. And so they, you could, and there were tons of startups, tons of startups there. Um, And a lot of, a lot of other sort of companies that were there as well. Um, But it was fantastic. They had, they had something like 600 users in the Slack workspace. Um, And then what they would do is they, and they had these ask the expert sessions where you could just log in to a live zoom and you could throw questions at them. There was always one for opera and one for symphony. So they were, so they didn't mix them up. And then you could be, you could be a vendor built, you know, coding away at the integration. If you got caught in that week, you could go on Slack and ask a question and somebody from Oracle would answer you in real time. And if they couldn't answer you via Slack chat, they would throw a Zoom link at you and say, here, log in and let's That's talk great. about it. And it, I had never, so I lurked all week because we're already a certified partner. We've got our own Oxy. Um, but I didn't really understand what it was. And I'm, I managed the Oracle relationship for us. So I just logged in. I registered and logged in. And it was fascinating. It was wow. absolutely fascinating. And I will say at the end of the week, everyone raved about and people were raving about Oracle hospitality support from the vendor side. I mean, not even from the hotel side. There were hoteliers there who were building like their own integration, right? If they were doing something homegrown and integrating to Opera or Symphony, but I'd never been in anything like it. So it's so there weren't educational sessions and there weren't like vendor, uh, there weren't vendor exhibits. But I, you know, I had side conversations with vendors I didn't know. Um, People were asking each other questions. It was really great. Uh, so it, it had the elements of kind of that hackathon thing. unmeasurable kind of. benefit of, of, of attending an event, right? Like That's you, right. you were able to have those side conversations be introduced to That's things. Right. But it also had a, another interesting effect to it, you know, which you just said, which was the vendor community that it was involved in. It was raving about the support Oracle right. gave, right. which is, you know, counter- how most mm-hmm. in this industry, let alone just the vendors, right. feel about Oracle. That's brilliant. Yeah. That's yeah. really smart. It was really great. I mean, I, I and I hadn't seen anything in the press about it. Like nobody reviewed yeah. it. Oracle didn't, I mean, they made a big deal about it. Um, I mean, lots of people got invitations, but it wasn't clear what it was. Right. Now they have monthly Ask the Expert, live Ask the Expert session. That's brilliant. It's really risky, I, I would think, um, from working from a, for a set, uh, software provider before and, you know, working closely with the development team and the product team, you know, that opens you up for a lot of, why aren't you doing this? Or, you know, this works for, for my hotel, but it may not work for every other hotel. I, I want you to focus your energy on this. Did you get a lot of that, Valen, Or There wasn't, um, because they were very clear about what the purpose was they were super clear if you've got an integration and you're working on it you know and it doesn't matter so it could be you could be building an oxy you could be building ows um using oracle web services or the oxy technology or symphony um and they were very clear the purpose of this is to support an integration from your product to, to opera or symphony period this is not about functionality of opera this is not about you know whatever this is strictly about integration so they kept it super focused um, and like it, it, there was not, there was not a salesperson in sight. The CEO, Alex Alts did a, a welcome for like 10 minutes. And then, and then all the Oracle people were support people, support people, mm. developers, integration. Support people. Yeah. It was the people that you had to talk to, to get an integration done. Yep. And it wow. was so interesting because they just used Slack and zoom, right? They mm-hmm. didn't, they didn't, it couldn't have cost them that much. I mean, it cost them just all. time, just yeah. time. That's, That's it. Right. Yeah. yeah, you know, and, you remind me you know, way back goes, goes back really, really far. But Google used to do this with uh, before SMX. There was uh, another uh, uh, Danny Sullivan started. It was SMM or whatever. I met uh, actually. I met uh, uh, Banu uh, back in the day, going to these conferences out in, in Palo Alto, and uh, Google used to have what was called Google Dance, where you actually went to the Google campus, and all the engineers for all the departments were there, and you could go anywhere in Google and go and talk to the engineers. And it was the most amazingly cool thing to sit and listen to what they're doing with the maps what they're doing, and ask questions like, well, how do we do this? And it's just, you know, so to your point, that's, that was brilliant for Oracle to do that because when well, you walked away going, 
oh man, Google's got some great stuff going on. You felt like you were on the inside of like, I got some stuff solved. I actually got things done right. compared to just being exposed to stuff. So, and, yeah, and I mean, great. to be fair to Oracle, they have a bad rap for connectivity, but they actually, compared to a lot of the big PMS architectures, the only problem with Oracle was the price tag. You right. could connect. You could get any connection you want, but it's like 20 plus grand to certify to it. Mm. You know, which that is, that's been kind of the gripe with with Oracle. But when you compare it to some of the others uh, where, you know, e even if they wanted to connect to you, they just didn't have middleware that could handle any right. form of API call. Like at least Oracle had something. But yes, these modern open API PMSs, you know, they're they're they've created this kind of pressure. Right. On the on the bigger players, and you think about it, like what the heck's Agilisys ever going to do to answer that? AS four hundred is incredibly difficult right. to connect web services to uh -huh. and have function. Right. Um, you know, because AS four hundred by nature is meant to not communicate with right. the outside world. It's why right. it's used by financial institutions, right. and you know, <laughs> it's uh, fast and it's it's super super fast because there's no input into it. Right. It's just right. spinning along. Right. Yeah. Right. So that's I cool that Oracle, they did that. I think is I think they put themselves in a great position. It's so interesting this whole conversation about APIs and open APIs because you know you can have an open API, but if it's crap, right. Well, what, you know, first question you should always ask a company with an open API is, does your application consume these APIs? Right. Do you use them yourself? Mm -hmm. And if the answer is no, then you know that that <laughs> API right. is garbage. Uh, because sure, it may have worked the day they released it. It will be broken the next patch. Right. That's right. Yeah, That's very right. true. Yeah. Adele, I'm well, so be interesting to see what tech says. Go ahead, Jason. I'm sorry. Adele, I'm so curious your take on the hotel tech stack coming from library and being sort of, you know, my guess is building a lot of this stuff on your own rather than being with a brand who's providing a single platform or saying you have to use this or you have to use this. How you know, how was your experience with what exactly what Valen and Ed are talking about, open APIs and integrations and getting all these systems to talk to each other? It seems so complicated. It's it's excruciating. And um, <clears throat> for example, at the, with the deal assist, you know, every time we say that we want to integrate something, the fee on the, like, I'm totally all in. I, I met somebody at the rock uh, meeting and I am ready to go. And by the time <laughs> I actually got that done was more than a year later mm. because of the negotiating with the jail assist for, for all the hotels. And then they, and the other company would say, we don't really need to talk to a jail assist. We're just going to go in and pull, you know, whatever. And, but a jail assist, you do that. And we won't guarantee your security. So if anything goes wrong, it must be your fault. And it, so it, it really puts you in a perplexing thing. It, it just, it took a while. We finally got, we wanted, but every single time that we need something, even if we want to just customize our um, confirmation email or something, if we wanted to do it, you know, from the PMS because they're at the front desk and they don't want to sign into the PRS, you know, 10,000 up. Yep. <laughs> Yeah. Just be, before I jump, Crazy. before I jump, a quick plug for me. I'm working on a special report exactly about this this topic. I would love input from any of you guys if we want to connect afterward on this. You know, it, it seems to me that building a modern hotel tech stack was in, in, in you know reimagining the guest journey using this technology as the framework to you know gather analytics and present the right offers to the right guests throughout the whole journey was critically important, something we talked about ad nauseum until COVID hit. And then everybody was like, well, I can't go to the market with that message. It's going to fall on deaf ears. You know, how can I talk about recovery? Two or three months later, I think that topic is more relevant than ever because not only are you trying to figure out this new guest experience across all the touch points, but now you have to do it in a contactless manner um, where, you know, moving to digital is more important than ever. So um, thank you, Valen, for sharing that and Adele for, for sharing the challenges. I know I'm really trying to help the industry get to a better, 
plays with this integrations thing. You know, it's the fact that tickets go unresolved for weeks and systems are down and they're not talking to each other. It only doesn't serve the guest in the end, right? Right. Stuart would be a real good resource for that. He's, he's yeah. struggled through this many, many times and many, many flavors. <laughs> and, and, uh, and do you know Lewis from Happy? Uh, I don't, but I need that connection for yeah, because he yeah. would be really good. Because I mean, what kind of inspired him to do Happy was connecting all the work he had to do to connect hot sauce to everything that it needed to connect to, um, and and realizing you know how disparate uh, the data silos are um, across all these organizations, and even the ones that rudim- like do a rudimentary connection. Um, you know, data handling is the next big issue that our industry hasn't talked about yet because, you know, most aren't there yet. But, you know, everyone's disparate um, kind of willy nilly way that they do data uh, is is insane, like object names and, you know, all of that. It's different in every single database, which means, you know, you're not just talking about, oh, we need a connection. It's no, you need a connection that works. And in order for it to work, you need a middleware that's going to convert this way of treating the object to the way that the database that you're connecting to can handle. Uh, And that's, that's kind of the untalked about issue in connectivity uh, is point for us. It was always room types or room connections. You had to map them between the various systems and it's room mapping was the number one thing we talked about at easy yield all the time (laughs) because that was the huge, uh, you know, kind of time consuming beast was, was handling pointing to Valen's point on, on, um, uh, Oracle getting better. Was it Oracle? Um, yeah. You know, they, they, that's most important is that CS component to it, right? The being able to get somebody on the phone and, you know, I'm new to this system. I need to figure out how to integrate it, how to make it work properly and show me all the functionality that I need to know. I think Alex yeah. Alto was a great hire for them. Mm-hmm. Like, I think he can really change them. Um, I really liked what he did when he was at Sabre. Um, right. I thought he did a great job there, improved their uh, integration to the industry, uh, on all fronts. So, you know, I had said that to Lauren when I first saw the announcement, I was like, this was a great hire for them. Yeah. Yeah. I think the challenges for him, just like probably the head of any business unit inside massive Oracle is working within that, that behemoth that is Oracle, right? Make the change without They're not as, but see, that's the funny thing outside of their hospitality division, they're not as broken. Like Oracle's actually fairly easy to work with for their standard tech. Right. Um, right. Has really good support. It's fairly open. You know, I think they adopted the methodology of the industry, which was that that primal well, self preservation is sandbox. They bought a company board. that was the epitome of the walled right. garden. That's exactly. Yep. Right. <laughs> and have been just slowly trying to figure out how to right. you know make that function as a true you know vertical software. Right. Mm-hmm. Well, guys, I hate to interrupt, but I got to jump. I got to yep. jump too. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, we're, we're well past our normal uh, two hours of happiness and joy, which has been awesome. Thank <laughs> you. Uh, and thank you for all the contributions of the content and everything. Literally, we didn't hit Robert's list. And Robert, this is no deference to your list. It's a phenomenal <laughs> list. It will be included in the show notes. Uh, it's got great content to it always. And I've also not watching this. yours as well. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> If you would like to sign up, if you would like to sign up for Robert's list, go to bit.ly bit.ly forward slash rock cheetah all lowercase. It is a great weekly, well curated list. And of course, Jason with Hotel Recovery 2020, uh, daily content on that uh, for all these things and so Jason, forth. And, what are you going to call it in January? I'm sorry? What are you going to call it in January? That's a great question. I haven't figured out that out yet, Ed. I, I kind of go one day at a time, let alone one week at a time. I like it. I like it. <laughs> but it may be so good. recovery 2021. But you, could do, you could do what the Olympics did, you know? Hotel recovery 2020 and one. <laughs> and one. <laughs> so initially in March, Ed, I thought the recovery was going to be done by 2020. I thought we were going to be fully recovered by yeah, December. I hope you're prepared 2020. to support that for the I'm next not, year. I'm not sure that's going to be the case. Yeah. So, so uh, one one ask I do have is like when major milestones like that benefit the industry happen, can you change the name of it for a couple of days to just like woohoo? Yeah. Like, <laughs> like it, it's just a celebration. Yay. Milestone. Milestone. Memes, uh, yeah. Well, memes and gifts. We'll be good with it. Yeah, good. Uh, just on those so, days. 
<laughs> so Lily, for, for people to know about your podcast and what you do for TCRM services and things up, where can they find you? Sure, you can find us at tcrmservices.com for all things day-to-day -day revenue management, uh, including boosting your results if your current provider uh, may not be achieving what you need them to right now in revenue management. Kick them out the door. Right. <laughs> well, either that or we can run alongside them uh, to make the sure that they're pushing, <laughs> pushing in all the right areas. Uh, but thinkupenterprises.com is where we do a lot of our consulting and thought leadership, including the podcast and uh, episode, I believe it's 14, is up right now uh, with the VP of Revenue for Sandpiper Hospitality, where they're talking about really how to win when you're working with a primarily limited service extended stay portfolio. So if that's you, check it out. Thanks, everybody. Cool. Thanks, Thanks, Lily. Everybody. Adele, if you want to know more about what you're transitioning into and doing currently, where is it? <laughs> Uh, you can, uh, if you want to uh, significantly increase your guest satisfaction scores, and I tell you, it does have a great impact on your revenue, that uh, you can reach me at uh, Adele at AspireReputation.com or visit my new website. Still a work in progress, but you'll get the idea. www AspireReputationMarketing.com. And when you and I still have some time we get to spend together, or you had some things that you thought I could uh, help with. Oh, or yes. Question, right? Next so week. we got to get together still on that. Thank um, you. Yeah, no, I hadn't forgotten. It's just. Um, Thank you so much. Today, this was a crazy week. <laughs> yeah, it's been interesting. Valen, for those who want to know more about you and Nor One. Sure. So um, norone.com. I'm valen.perini, just about everywhere. And all I have to say is our data shows that guests still want upsells and will pay for them. So don't do free upgrades. There you go. Perfect. <laughs> Jason, it has been a pleasure to have you pop back in again, as, as always. So hopefully we can drag you back in in the near future as well. But if what people want to know more about Hotel Recovery 2020 and what it is that you're producing, uh, where can they find you? Yeah, first uh, two places, clecontent.com. If you have, a, if you're an innovative hotelier or a supplier and looking for somebody to tell your story and generate some leads, um, a subset of that is I launched Hotel Recovery 2020 in April just to help people get back on their feet. Um, I'm going to try to raise some money for some hoteliers who have been terminated and furloughed in phase two, uh, but phase one is just providing the data and the resources for hoteliers to get back on track. So check both of those out. And lastly, I really appreciate uh, you having me on, Lauren, and, and meeting everybody and uh, connecting with everybody again. It's been great. That's awesome when we have you. Mr. Ed, you and Flip2. You can, uh, and the go number to, one school in the whatever. Well, that's in Orlando. Um, <laughs> you can go to flip.to. Uh, you can find me on social media, Edward St. Ange. Uh, and Mr. Lauren Gray, if people want to spend the next three weeks watching 24 <laughs> hours a day, two months watching 24 hours a day of our chattering heads confidently uh, spewing our opinion, opinion. where could they go? <laughs> <laughs> they can go to hospitalitydigitalmarketing.com forward slash live there you'll see this and all previous 259 episodes uh six years in the running actually we're coming up on our anniversary in the next couple of weeks um clicking over another year of happiness and joy uh and also too we have a podcast marketing podcast which i put a produce in the afternoons after this which says a quick recap the podcast is only 20 minutes long the show is two and a half hours but the podcast is only 20 minutes long um but we do tools tricks techniques and so forth on that podcast and to lily's point she does one for revenue management and to call out to holly zoba she does our sales podcast as well. Adele, I'm going to start twisting your arm in the near future to start seeing if you want to translate what you're doing into a podcast because I think it would be incredibly <laughs> valuable to have you have some sort of perpetual insights that you would like to share in that thank format. You. I think it would be wonderful at that. One uh, day. So with that in mind, thank you, everyone, for those who have been on all the different platforms that we simulcast on uh, and for you all for spending all the whole time that you did uh, on the show. Until next show, which will be with a guest host, thanks to Adele. Um, and who are we having next week, Adele? David Malili from uh, Angie Hospitality. The who's newly talk minted about, CEO. Uh, contactless and uh, voice activated uh, rooms. I think it's fascinating. It'll be a lot of fun, and we'll definitely have to get the connection going for make sure he's all comfortable with the format of you know the technology, whatever. But we'll go through that process. But that'll be our guest host next week, Friday, eleven thirty Eastern U.S. time. And of course, this will be simulcasted back. 
uh, 11.30 Wednesday morning, uh, Sydney, Australia time, and 11.30 a.m. Uh, London time on Wednesday. And we are transcribed now in 10 languages. Uh, and if there's another language that we want to be transcribed into, please let me know, because I keep adding them as I keep seeing the visitors come through different countries. I just throw their language in, too. So we've just added Japanese, <laughs> Japanese and Korean. Uh, we already put Filipino and Hindu in there, so we're doing pretty good so far. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Lauren, this clarification, is that transcribing for people to read, or is that... Yeah, read, read. Oh, okay. I did, I did do a Spanish version of my podcast. Hmm? And where do you post the transcriptions to? That's on, uh, that's on YouTube. It actually will be, if you pull up the, the closed captioning on the, re 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 uh, the rebroadcast of this, you'll have all your language options to choose from. Awesome. Great to know. So, yeah, cool. multi-language happiness. So, thank you, everyone. <laughs> and we'll see everyone uh, next Friday, 1130 uh, U.S. Have a great one. <laughs> thank Bye. you.